still okay in terms of sound? So I'll, and I might get a little louder like this. Okay, and uh, so if I'm this far away, is it still picked up? Or do you need me to get closer like that? Okay, so I just want to be able to follow it. I have my shadow also in front of me. So. <laughs> What's that? Yep, you got someone else speaking first, right? All right. So there's going to be a break. And this is the one we're starting with, with me and Gilbert. So if Gilbert and I are here, we're slightly off center to the X. Okay. Sort of angled like this. Okay. So Gilbert, you're going to actually start all the way up on stage with me. So you can come on up. Because I'm literally going to pretty much just introduce us, get us to prayer. You'll pray, and then you'll exit um, stage and all kind of...
Welcome, we're so thrilled to have you. I'm Victoria Cobb, president of the Family Foundation. Welcome joining our very first benefit simulcast, Redeeming the Crisis. I'm here with our friend Gilbert Wilkinson. We first uh, came to love Gilbert as just a fellow fighter in the conservative battle. He then became the founder of the Black Society for Economic and Social Transformation, a group that we're helping to try to get going and they're, they're based out of our building. But today we thought we'd bring him in to start this event for us in prayer, in particular in this moment, because he wears another hat, which is that he is the division chaplain for the Henrico Police Department. That's the local police department here where we stand. And just given the situation with the loss of life of George Floyd and just the unrest in our city and in cities all across America, we thought, uh, who better to take us to prayer than somebody that's working directly with our armed uh, officers. So thank you. Yes. Take it away. Could you bow for me in prayer? Heavenly Father, first of all, I come against all the fear and doubt during these crises. Lord, the church of Jesus Christ stands strong in adversity. The true church of Jesus Christ stands strong in adversity, and we stand in faith. We stand together, Lord. Father, we lift up our president, his administration, the vice president, the cabinets, Lord, Democrats and Republicans. We pray, Father God, that you would guide them. Guide them with wisdom and truth. Lord, let your word penetrate their heart, Father. Father, we pray, Lord, that you will guide them as you guide the rivers of water. Lord, touch their hearts, Father, deep within, Lord. Minister to their needs, Father. Father, we pray for all of our first responders, O oh God, police, fire and ambulances, O oh God. We pray, God, your peace. We pray for their families. We pray, God, that when they go out, Lord, that your angels will have charge over them. Lord, we even pray for the people in the streets, oh God, that's protesting. We pray, God, that you will give them peace in their hearts, Father God. We pray that you would touch them in their inner being, God. Father, we pray that you will heal our land, Lord God. Heal it, oh God, in such a way that we all would be reconciled. And that, God, that you would touch lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you. We thank you for all the men and women on this simulcast, Father. Lord, let them be refreshed today. Let them be renewed today in their hope. Lord, let them be touched by the spirit of the living God. And Father, as we, as we go forward, Lord, give them wisdom and understanding. We pray for the Family Foundation, God, and Victoria. God, that the work that they're doing may continue by the mercies and the grace of God. And all of all, I'll say, Amen. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank, thank you. you so much. Well, just to give a little background on how we got here and why this theme. Um, obviously, when the pandemic hit, when things began uh, to really impact us here in Virginia, uh, we felt the loss. Everyone felt the loss. Some felt it just in missed events, uh, some momentous occasions like graduation. Generations felt the loss of physical touch between each other, grandparents to grandchildren. Um, and some of us felt the loss in actual human life. For the Family Foundation, uh, we felt the loss very early on, Easter weekend actually, when we lost the life of our first chaplain of our pastor's organization, our, our arm of our organization that is associated with pastors, Bishop Gerald Glenn, um, lost his life to COVID on Easter weekend. And uh, so for all of us, this has been a season of hardship in different ways for different people. Um, and I, you know, I, I, in that moment, I was just sort of questioning God, why would we cut his ministry, such a wonderful man, such an amazing ministry short. Um, everyone is experiencing that sense of loss and anxiety through these moments, but we have a big God. And as we continued in this time where the normal looked very abnormal to all of us, we figured out something, which is uh, personally, I began to realize that with endless family time, I found great joy. With being able to educate my children at home, I got new insight on them and how they learn and what they were learning. And we found that when I was out in nature, you know, I had probably quadruple the amount of time to be outside, I found a deeper connection with God. And as our team looked around, even in all the hardship, we saw that in this moment, our 
tried and true conservative principles were more true than ever. They were more important than ever. We began to see that in fact, in a crisis, as we've always known, the family is at the center of it all. The people who were faring best were those with solid, strong families. And again, we've always said family is the solution. And so what we wanted to do when we were thinking about how to bring something hopeful and beneficial, we thought, how can we talk about this moment of the pandemic in a way that we really highlight the issues and really walk away, we hope, with something where we can have fruitful conversations with our friends and neighbors about life and family and education in a way that has been evidenced during this pandemic. So we really are excited to bring you this content today. And uh, we thought, who better to start off the whole thing talking about family than somebody that we've always had a close, deep connection to, and that is Jim Daly over at Focus on the Family. The Family Foundation has been associated, we have been their organization here in Virginia since we were started about 35 years ago, and we just can't say enough about the ministry that they have and the priority that they have put on the family unit and healthy families. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Daly at Focus on the Family. Hi, everybody. I'm Jim Daly, and it's a privilege to join you. And I want to thank Victoria Cobb for the invitation. It would be impossible to overstate the great work that the Family Foundation of Virginia is doing each and every day. When it comes to the many issues you're advocating for and against, our hearts beat as one. From the defense of innocent preborn life to God's design for marriage, to celebrating and championing our first freedoms, Focus on the Family and the Family Foundation of Virginia are laboring shoulder to shoulder, or maybe I need to say side by side, six feet apart. <laughs> hey, the theme today is redeeming this COVID-19 crisis, and that may not seem like an easy thing. Uh, the death toll attributed to the coronavirus pandemic continues to rise, and behind every number is a name, and we mourn each loss. If your family's been impacted by the death of a loved one, uh, we send our sympathy and our prayers for sure. And maybe you've lost your job. Over 36 million people have filed for unemployment since this crisis began. But life has changed for each one of us in some way. When I was asked to speak about redeeming our families, I thought about an email I received the other day from a friend. He asked me what I think God is trying to tell us through the massive upheaval these past few months. It's been hard to believe what's happening. It's kind of surreal. But my friend shared with me that famous C.S. Lewis observation. Lewis knew suffering, and so he wrote from a point of understanding. I don't pay much attention to people who talk about suffering, but who haven't suffered themselves. If you think about it, maybe that's why God decided to send his son, Jesus, to earth. Of all the religions of the world, there's only one whose God suffered, died, and rose again in order to save others. Lewis famously wrote, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. And it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And this pandemic has been a time of pain, and I hope uh, we can hear God shouting in it. And I want to share something, I think, profound that somebody shared with me. Imagine you were an American born in 1900. At age 14, World War I begins. It ends on your 18th birthday with 22 million dead people. And later in that year, a Spanish flu epidemic strikes and 50 million people die from it by the time you're 20. Yes, 50 million. And when you're 29, the Great Depression hits. Unemployment reaches 25% and global GDP drops 27%. And that continues until you're 33. The country nearly collapses along with the world economy. And when you turn 39, World War II starts, and you're not even over the hill yet. And by the time you're 41, the United States is drawn into a war. And between your 39th and 45th birthday, 75 million people die in that war. And the Holocaust kills 6 million. At 52, the Korean War begins and 5 million more perish. Approaching your 62nd birthday, there's the Cuban Missile Crisis, a tipping point in the Cold War. At 65, the U.S. enters the Vietnam War and goes on for years. Four million die in that conflict. Life as we know it could have very well ended. 
but great leaders prevented that from happening. As you turn 75, the Vietnam War finally ends. Think of everyone on the planet born in 1900. How do you survive it all? A young person in 1985 didn't think their 85-year-old grandparent understood how hard school was. Yet those grandparents, and now great-grandparents, survived all that I just mentioned. Perspective is an amazing thing. And let's try and keep some perspective. Let's be smart, help each other out, and we'll get through this. I believe that tragedy and crisis are magnifiers. Whatever you're struggling with, a tragedy just makes it worse. The global pandemic has claimed close to 100,000 lives across the U.S., and that's so sad. But I've noticed something else. In recent months, I'm seeing a greater hunger for things that really matter, like faith and relationships, and a greater appreciation for family. So here are several things that I believe God is shouting to me, and I hope you, today about the family. First, he's telling us, I'm here. God is in the middle of the mayhem. He is not surprised by it or perplexed by it. It's a shock to us, but not to him. Lean into him. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. It's what it says. This is not the first pandemic either, and it won't be the last. Every generation has a time of testing. This is ours, but we're not alone. Second, I believe God is saying this is not the end, but a new beginning. We need to set aside our small and selfish, fearful thoughts. Yes, it hurts that graduations and proms were canceled. It's a bummer, and you missed a spring break trip, and a, maybe a Little League game was canceled too, or several. But don't dwell on the things you can't control. Why worry? Worry is like a rocking chair. It gives you something to do, but you don't get anywhere by doing it. Remember, God makes all things new, even us. Look beyond your challenging situation to get some perspective. Find the beauty in the ashes. And like the saying goes, diamonds are formed under pressure. The pandemic is giving us a chance to spend more time with our loved ones. My wife Jean and I have been spending more time in the morning reading the word and praying together. It's so good to reconnect at that level. And it's also been good to have our eldest son home from college. So again, let's have some perspective and think of this as a new beginning. I also think God is reminding us that heaven is real. As the death toll mounts, it's hard not to think of eternal life. Scripture says that our lives are but a vapor, but we can't lose sight of what's coming after this life. I recently interviewed uh, John Burke, who's written a great book called Imagine Heaven, Near-Death Experiences, God's Promises, and the Exhilarating Future That Awaits You. Uh, John Burke was an agnostic. He, he didn't know if there was a, a God or if the afterlife was real. The closest he got to spirituality was believing that Jesus was a good teacher whose life somehow became the stuff of legend and myth. Then John's dad got cancer, and John began to wonder more deeply about life's big questions. And during that time, someone gave his father a book of original research that coined the term near-death experience. And when John read people's stories about bright lights, tunnels, and strange visions, it set him on what became a 35-year quest to examine those experiences more deeply. He interviewed over a thousand people, surgeons, pilots, pastors, bank presidents, college professors. He began seeing a lot of common themes, all pointing to this main belief, heaven is a very real place and we should live like it is. Another thing I believe God is reminding us of is to not forsake him. Are you frustrated? Why is God allowing all of this to happen? Those are fair questions. It's okay to ask those of God. Even Job questioned God's plan. But despite losing his health and wealth, he never turned away from God, and neither should we. What's important to understand is that God doesn't operate on our schedule. He sees things we can't see. My friend Dr. Tim Keller, who started Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, once said, God will only give you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he knows. John Newton, the Anglican pastor and abolitionist, probably best known for writing the hymn Amazing Grace, once said, everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. Think about that. Everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. That means whatever you're going through right now is necessary. 
somehow, some way. And then finally, I believe God is reminding us very simply that he loves us. Nothing is more perfect than the love of our Heavenly Father. He knows, he cares, and he understands. And I'm convinced that God is speaking to the world in the middle of this pandemic. Now, I don't believe he caused it, but he's allowed it. And he's using it to accomplish his purposes. Are we paying attention? Are we listening? We live in a world where a lot of noise makes the news and grabs our attention. It was the 17th century mathematician and philosopher Blaise Pascal who once remarked, all men's miseries derive from not being able to sit in a quiet room alone. And as I alluded to earlier, we're all missing out on a lot of things these days. But that's only half the story. Now I want to play a short video for you that was created by the team here at Focus on the Family. Take a look. I think we all miss a lot of things. Hundreds of thousands have missed their good health. Millions are missing their jobs and a steady paycheck. Hundreds of millions are missing life as it used to be. We miss playing with the kids at the park or going to dinner at our favorite restaurant. We miss gathering with family and friends for events big and small, weddings, birthdays, and holidays. We miss going to church in person, attending Sunday school, potlucks and time with our pastor, little league and scouting, concerts and recitals. Many of us are looking backwards to better days, unsure what to look forward to. Will I be able to take the vacation, go to the lake, or swim in the ocean on a warm summer day? It's easy to miss what you had and what you want. But don't miss what's right before your eyes. Don't miss your loved ones out of your life. The extra time you have with them. Remember, this is a time that will never come back. A time you wish you could get back when this is all over. And the world will be gone. Don't miss the laughs, the movies, and the board games. The good ones you've been wanting to read. Or maybe you have a long time. about. I miss meeting with our supporters. I draw energy from people, but it's good to be reminded of what God is trying to teach us. And there have been a lot of stories coming out of the coronavirus, good and bad, but let me share one that I think will encourage you. It's a sad story, but it has a sweet and poignant twist. A month or so ago, a man named John Quelo passed away of cardiac arrest, a condition attributed to the coronavirus. And John was only 32. He lived in Danbury, Connecticut, and left behind his wife, Katie, and two small children. There's a common saying that death always comes like a thief in the night. And that's especially true when a younger person unexpectedly dies. John's wife was stunned and shaken. In her grief, she grabbed her husband's phone to look at some pictures he'd saved there. Katie saw the photos, but she also found something else, an unsent message, a note John had written intended for her. John wrote, I love you guys with all my heart, and you've given me the best life I could have ever asked for. And I'm so lucky. It makes me so proud to be your husband and the father to Braden and Penny. He continued, Katie, you are the most beautiful, caring, nurturing person I've ever met. You're truly one of a kind. Make sure you live life with happiness and that same passion that made me fall in love with you. Seeing you be the best mom to the kids is the greatest thing I've ever experienced. Wow, uh, what a gift John left his wife. It's got me thinking, if I were to suddenly pass away, what would my wife Jean have on my phone to remember me by? A litany of work exchanges or lots of loving texts and notes between the two of us and from me to my boys. It may sound morbid to write a last letter to your spouse, but have you ever considered it? What would you say 
You might remember Randy Pausch, the computer science professor from Carnegie Mellon University who was diagnosed with terminal cancer and whose last lecture to his class became an internet sensation. The lecture was turned into a best-selling book. He died at the age of 48, just months after the title was published. He told his students the key question to keep asking is, are you spending your time on the right things? Because time is all you have. Does the content of your phone reflect your priorities? More importantly, does your life? The COVID-19 pandemic has been called by some the big pause. Not for everybody, of course, but for many. If you have some extra time, why not spend some of it praying and pondering how the Lord wants you to spend the rest of your days here on earth? And before closing, I want to recommend a few things you can do as a family to bring you closer together. One thing we need to do is eat together. Man, Gene has been so good at this, and hopefully you're already doing this. But sit at the table together, not in front of television or phones. Plan a menu, assign jobs in the kitchen to each person in the family, and then sit down and break bread together. Research shows that families who share meals are happier and more successful. There you go. And kids are more likely to open up while eating. Also, take some time to reminisce. The Bible tells us to be careful never to forget what we've seen God do for us and to tell our children and grandchildren about his work. So pull out the family albums or family videos. Tell the old stories, even sharing with your kids again how you and your spouse met. Tell them again about the day they were born. Shared history brings us together. We can look back, but we should also look ahead. It's been said that looking forward to things is half the fun of it. And I think that's true. Yes, schedules have been upended and plans have been scuttled. But what are you looking forward to when the virus fades? There might be a lot of question marks surrounding your summer. But stay hopeful and imagine good days ahead. And then keep moving. Uh, Gene and I have been getting out for two to three mile walks each day, most days, and it's become a real favorite part of our time together. It's important to get the heart rate up and sweat cleanses us from the inside out. But activity is about more than maintaining good physical health. Thomas Jefferson said, exercise and application produce order in our affairs, health of body, cheerfulness of mind, and these make us precious to our friends. Lastly, remember to dream and pray. Is there something you've been thinking about doing for years? A big goal that seems a little beyond your reach. Start a new business, write a book, go back to school and get that degree or certification you've wanted. Goals provide structure and focus, so write down your dreams. Pray and ask God for guidance to make sure your aspirations align with His will for your life. And let's also pray for God to turn the tide on this pandemic while we make good use of the time he's given us in this difficult season. And before I go, I want to share one last thing, unrelated to the coronavirus. Speaking very personally, um, I am grieving the actions of your governor. Earlier this year, on Good Friday of all days, Governor Ralph Northam used his power to promote death, signing the so-called Reproductive Health Protection Act. With a swipe of the pen, Northam rolled back decades worth of legislation crafted to protect the unborn and vulnerable women. The law eliminates basic health and safety standards in abortion facilities, permits nurse practitioners and nurse midwives to perform abortions, removes the requirement of an ultrasound before an abortion, and abolishes the 24-hour waiting period between the ultrasound and the abortion. Your governor used a weekend designed to celebrate good news to instead champion evil news. And it will not stand. We remain committed to working with you to protect innocent human life. And we won't stop until every life is protected under the law. Thank you for what you've done, what you're doing, and what you will do in the days, weeks, and months ahead. The Lord is up to something. None of this has caught him by surprise. So let's continue to pray for a miracle and ask him to protect all who are in harm's way. God bless you. 
Well, when I thought of who could help me digest a video from Jim Daly, I couldn't help but think Candy Cushman. Candy joins us at the Family Foundation on our team as our new director of grassroots initiatives from Focus on the Family originally. 19 years there. You might not know her face, but you probably know her project, Bring Your Bible to School Day, if your kids participated in that. It was uh, largely done by Candy. But I so appreciated what uh, Jim Daly said. I, I took away from it perspective, you know, keeping it in perspective. We lost some Little League games but the world moves on. So I appreciated that. What was your, what's your take on what Jim said? Yeah, I really appreciated that bigger perspective, especially with what he said when he reminded us of that famous quote from C.S. Lewis, that a lot of times God uses all this pain as a megaphone to get our attention. And boy, do we have so much pain as a nation right now, um, just with the just physical suffering with COVID-19 that you've already talked about and the economic devastation. And now our country just the degradation of life that we see as we're wrestling through this issue of racism and the riots coming out of that. I mean, it just, it feels like our country's being torn apart. Um, but I, I took the hope that he had um, that this is not the end, this is the beginning. And personally, that encourages me as well when he brought up what our governor did, um, signing probably one of the worst abortion laws in the whole country on Good Friday of all things. Um, but you know, I, I just with the perspective he gave, I feel hope because I feel like he signed it on Good Friday and Good Friday with its message of resurrection and victory has the last word in this, not this celebration of death. So, you know, I feel like we have that hope that we can defeat these laws. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that. He, he mentioned our governor. We've known and we tried to tell people before the election that this is what he believed. We knew it when he was a senator, actually, in our Virginia State Senate. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to share a video with you in just a moment where we actually see one of our heads of our pregnancy center speaking about the bill that he introduced as a senator coming after pregnancy resource centers. So we've known that for a long time, but then after this video, uh, I'm excited to hear about the initiatives that you have going at the Family Foundation. Take a look. Three Virginians, three serious problems. I started learning a couple of years ago about how uh, the school board was doing really horrible things in the area of sex ed, sort of locking the parents out of the whole deliberation process. I thought, I have got, I cannot sit by and watch this happen. a sign on my door that said that I had no medical professionals on site, and we do. We have about 2,500 visits here to the PRC of Metro Richmond every year, and we are so grateful to the Family Foundation. If it had not been for them, we would have had no idea about the actual legislation that was brought against us. Three Virginians, three serious problems, one solution. The Family Foundation of Virginia not only recognized these problems, but they did the necessary research, provided essential information, and showed up to support each of them. The Family Foundation gave me information I did not have. They gave me courage that I would not have had. And really gave me wisdom in knowing what to do. Having the Family Foundation of Virginia and the General Assembly monitor these things is the from God. These Virginians need the Family Foundation in order to effectively fight for what they believe in. And the Family Foundation needs you to help continue this important work in Virginia.
You know, I just love watching those stories because they so well encapsulate the values that we're fighting for on a day-to-day -day basis at the Family Foundation and how they impact the everyday lives of Virginians. And you know, when you boil it all down, um, those issues really fall into three basic areas. Life, the sanctity of life, family, and religious freedom. That's what we're working every day to defend. And that's why it was so disturbing to see this last legislative session, really all three of those areas under unprecedented attack. Really, I think in each of those areas, they were undermined in ways that we have not seen before in Virginia's history. Um, you know, Jim did a great job, Jim Daly did a great job touching on how that was done with life, how we saw reversals in the life area that were just devastating, but also parental rights were undermined, you know, parents' rights to speak in to what their kids are being taught about sexuality, and we know that there's very real threats right now as a result of these laws to our churches and our religious schools, to their basic freedom to operate according to their biblical beliefs. So I think the big picture in all that, when we look at that, what happened, is that many of our elected leaders feel completely unaccountable um, to a large swath of our population, really to our voices, the voices of millions of moms and dads like you that are watching this, Christians like me that care about the future of our state, uh, Christian leaders that came up to the Capitol and really didn't even have a chance, they weren't allowed to have their, you know, to speak. Um, so what we want to do is give those voices back. It is time, we really feel passionate that it is time to give those voices back. And we feel like the best way to do that is if we can amplify our voices by joining them together across the state in a way that gives us a more powerful voice that cannot be ignored. And so we are doing this through a new initiative that I am very excited to work on here called Speak Up Virginia. And the way this is going to work is really twofold, a twofold strategy with this. First of all, we're going to be building up a mobilization force for the family across the state through text and email. Now, I know a lot of you guys that are listening might already get some of our emails and alerts, but we're doing this at a whole new level. We want to bring in thousands more voices, even hundreds of thousands, and it just, it can't just be the Family Foundation alone at the state capitol. We need your voices, we need to link arms with you, and we need your help to get the word out about this movement as much as possible. So let me just go over a real quick way to get involved. I think on the screen, yeah, you should uh, have an image right now that tells you how to get involved, how to add your voice to this movement in a really easy way. And so first of all, if you have a cell phone with you, just pick that up right now and text speak up to the code 72572. That's 72572. And when you do that, you'll get immediately a link that will let you add your voice. Because just think about it. It'll just take you a couple of minutes when we send you an alert to just send that email off to your elected representative or respond to a text. But just in that couple of minutes that you're spending alone, you are multiplying your voice to thousands of others that is going to speak louder than we ever could when we're all operating in isolation. And this is so important right now during COVID-19 when we really can't be together physically, so this technology is so important that we all use this together. Um, so if you don't want to use the text, check out the website, familyfoundation.org slash speakupvirginia. That's familyfoundation.org slash speakupvirginia. And then I just want to mention one other way that we're building this mobilization force for the family, and that is through speak up teams. We are going to local communities and we're helping them create their own speak up teams. And we're going to be building speak up teams in at least five regions to start with, and that, that's going to scale up all across the state eventually. Um, but I'm so excited about that and working with you in local communities, and I just ask for your prayer um, over that whole effort and over these speak up teams. And just finally, I'll just say just one more thought here, um, that I know I started out with this sobering thought, um, you know, that we have these devastating laws, these heartbreaking laws that have passed, but there was good news too, and that is that we really saw an awakening that we have not seen before among the church, among the believers, who responded significantly more than we've seen in past years. Uh, we had thousands more people responding to our alerts. We had Christian leaders showing up that never come to the state capitol. Uh, a lot more Christian leaders and pro-life people working together. So I just want to challenge you, let's continue that momentum. Let's not let that die. Let's not grow weary in doing good even though it requires persistence. Let's keep that growing so that we are a united voice for the family that cannot be silenced. 
Wow, I'm sure you can see why we're excited to have Candy here at the Family Foundation. It's just such a blessing to get all this new energy and expertise and to, to be able to glean from all the experience that she had out at Focus on the Family, our great partner. So that's just been fantastic. Um, and right as we kind of shift into the next speaker, what I want to do first, though, is just tell you a little bit about why we're here. I mentioned early on that we are so thankful to be able to put this on. And it's really a result of having had three events that we were planning to do that were receptions out with you, talking to you, that we just simply can't have. And our goal during those receptions would have been to raise about $100,000 towards our budget. And thanks to some amazing sponsors, we actually were able to already raise $85,000 of that $100,000 towards our goal for our mission. These are never about events. They're always about how do we propel grassroots? How do we propel the public policy that we do? And so um, what I want to do right now is just mention that if you feel led to help us close that last gap um, on your screen, you should see right now the ability that what you can do with your phone is just simply go to uh, your, your text option and text 855 917-4488, that's the number, and then just type the word redeem off to that number, and it'll send you a link with a way that you can help support not just this simulcast, but really the mission of the Family Foundation as it goes forward, and help bridge that little gap that we still have. We're so grateful to even be able to be here. Uh, lots of organizations, as you know, are struggling financially during COVID, aren't sure how to shift uh, their charitable giving structure because we're not together. We're not able to do our kind of traditional ways that we connect with you. So thank you so much for the sponsors that have been a part of this. So um, at this point, what I want to do is go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, so uh, we are thrilled to have with us here in person. We don't have many people in person today simply because of the parameters that we're working under, but we are thrilled to bring up uh, Stella Morbido. She is an amazing speaker. We've had her at previous Family Foundation events years ago, um, but what we love about her, you'll see her right most particularly, she's a senior uh, columnist at The Federalist, but you can read her stuff at Human Discourse and so many other um, public discourse, so many other amazing, uh, thoughtful pieces. She has her background in uh, really studying uh, Russian and Soviet uh, analytics and understanding sort of the, the influence of socialism. And today, she's going to join us to speak a little bit about social isolation. Come on up. Um, and just the impact of social isolation and what that does to a society and what are kind of where we're going with all this and where the left would like to take us um, with this, this, this moment that we're in um, of being separated. So thank you so much for being here. We're thrilled to have you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Victoria, and for everybody at the Family Foundation for this wonderful opportunity to join you and to offer some thoughts about socialism and how the pandemic has revealed some of the designs of socialism by some of Amer uh, America's state and local leaders. I think it's given us what we've seen, a lot of the heavy handedness has given us um, a lot of clarity and perspective. But first, let me start by giving you my personal definition of socialism which goes by the name also of progressivism. Uh, in a nutshell, socialism means too much power in the hands of too few people. That's pretty much what it is. Whatever other motives socialists uh, claim to profess, the elites who promote socialism are interested primarily in the cons uh, consolidation of personal and political power. They reject checks and balances on that power. So. Um, I think this is a more direct way of looking at the issue of socialism rather than getting derailed by taking it at face value as some kind of an economic system. Um, that's a claim. I personally reject that. Economics is the pretext for a power grab. It's a system that's been proven uh, to be inefficient, causing economic stagnation, bureaucratic corruption, and human misery. But the essence of socialism is power by a clique of elites. And we've seen the, uh, the devastation of socialist systems throughout history that proves that. Uh, but most importantly, I want us to look at socialism more as a system that feeds on social distrust and social isolation. This is key, and I'm going to talk about this aspect of isolation more. During the pandemic, we got a glimpse of socialism, or a lot of glimpses, from the economic lockdowns that brought unemployment numbers to dangerous levels, which are now like over 40 million. 
Our experts at the outset told us that this was necessary to avoid a much higher death toll from the virus. But mass unemployment always comes with major casualties, including a lot of the social instability and social unrest uh, that you see. I mean, it's like adding match to Tinder uh, with uh, the rioting taking place today. But uh, if you add the inevitable inefficiency of government economic policy to all of this, and we see some reopening employers having difficulty getting their employees to come back because the unemployment checks, even though they're temporary, are larger than the salaries. And that is the siren call of socialism. It's a bait and switch in which people are lured into giving up their freedom for a little sense of security, which thus further empowers the elites who would run the state. But to better understand what we're up against, I want to talk especially about how socialist elites accrue their power. And I think this is just really important for us to start thinking in these terms. Socialism depends upon the erosion of personal relationships. And the erosion of re relationships is the way to build dependency upon the socialist elite and the power the elite, the elite gains through that dependency. And I'm going to put it one other way just to drive the point home. Socialism is about weakening the bonds between human beings and then controlling and regulating all human relationships. As these bonds are weakened, people are put into a state of isolation. And isolation does at least two things. First, it separates people from those free relationships, strong relationships that power elites can't control, like in the family and communities. Uh, and without those relationships, people become more dependent. Socialism, there's really nothing social about socialism. It's anti-family, anti-friendship, anti-thought, anti-free speech. It's really anti-conversation, all of which are relationship killers. Second thing that isolation does is it breeds alienation, an alienation that makes people hungry for the relationships that they're now missing after socialist policies are put in place. So people become ripe for participating in pseudo-communities and even mobs that socialists can and do use in order to accrue power. People who adopt a mob mindset are usually just seeking to feel some sense of belonging, which they are missing. People with strong relationships, on the other hand, they tend to be more immune to that groupthink, to that mob mindset. Sadly, socialist elites seem to know better than the rest of us that human relationships are the root and the source of all real power in society. The Soviet-era freedom fighter, his name was Václav Havel, Czech, um, from Czechoslovakia in 78, made that point in his essay entitled The Power of the Powerless. In it, he wrote, under you know, totalitarian systems, he was writing, that power really comes from the hidden sphere of life, from our personal relationships. It's in that private sphere of family, of close associations, friends, that the truth can live. It's in that sphere where ideas can be freely exchanged and where lies can be shot down which is, of course, why it, the hidden sphere is the target, always, of totalitarian systems. So I think and I hope we're getting a clearer picture of this as a result of watching the heavy-handedness of certain governors and officials during the pandemic as they invade that sphere of life, most noticeably the churches. So I'll talk about that, but first, what about socialist tactics? Most prominent among the tactics for relationship busting over the years has been political correctness and identity politics. Both of these are socialist tools that impose isolation on people in order to control them and their relationships. So look at political correctness. What's the purpose? To cultivate the threat and fear of social rejection. This is a primal human fear of loneliness in order to induce people to either shut up or lie about what they really believe. So if you disagree with the elites, and of course they own like over 90% of all of the outlets of communication so they can better control all of this. So if you disagree with them, they broadcast you as a bigot or a hater or a conspiracy theorist and the list goes on. 
So when fewer people express their opinion out of that fear, a spiral of silence takes hold and creates the illusion of a public opinion shift. That illusion then affects policy. So conformity with political correctness is designed to push us into that kind of self-isolation and then to perpetu perpetuate that isolation through policies that further force us into silence. Identity politics, likewise, is designed to isolate us and cut us off from freely developing our personal relationships. It works a little differently. It works by forcing us all into pigeonholes according to various characteristics like race or sex. It's meant, or what they call gender. It's meant to build resentments by dividing us into two general classes. You're either an oppressor or a victim, depending on your score. So if you happen to fall into the oppressor category just because of what you look like, it doesn't matter how much suffering you may have endured in life, it doesn't matter uh, what kind of experiences you had that might have informed your perspectives. Instead, you're left, you know, it doesn't matter what your personality is like, your, your sense of humor, none of that matters. You're left only with a manufactured artificial identity that's predetermined by identity politics that's meant to cut you off from knowing others as unique people, unique individuals, and, and even to cut yourself off from knowing yourself. So an interesting offshoot of political correctness and identity politics is their encouragement of a surveillance culture, a snitch culture, for those who violate their rules. But we, we have to always remember that the erosion and control of personal relationships is really the common thread that underlies socialism. You see it in terms of the socialism's history, you see it in terms of socialist policies, you see it in terms of socialist tactics that I just talked about, political correctness, identity politics, and we all see this reflected in reactions to the pandemic by those who would call themselves progressives, really socialists. So let's take a look at how these themes are playing out in this pandemic and how socialists are using the pandemic potentially to consolidate state power in ways harmful to our republic. We can look briefly at the family. Stay, now, the stay-at-home orders uh, do seem to strengthen family relationships where you have good, healthy, intact families. Uh, they have in many cases, but socialists have always hated the family. Remember the old 19th century Marxist slogan, abolish the family. Why? Well, because families are a decentralized force of millions, billions really, of unique associations that are based on loyalty and trust that they can't control. So that's anathema to socialism's aim to centralize and consolidate power. It's all the power of these relationships. So if nothing else, the stay-at-home orders of the pandemic should drive home that family relationships are critical to well-being, but they also should clarify to us that leftist policies have already caused destruction to the family as an institution. You can look back on any number of policies. I mean, for example, no-fall divorce. What does that do? It erodes the relationship between spouses. The drumbeat for easy abortion. It erodes the mother-child bond and how we respect it across society and all kinds of family relationships. Welfare policies promoted fatherlessness among children. The list just goes on and on. Where families are intact and healthy, um, you know, they helped us get through the uh, pandemic and the lockdown, but those who live alone or in broken families have suffered greatly during this period of isolation. Even healthy families are under strain. You may have read of incidents of police arresting parents playing with their kids in the park or harassing others for arranging a play date. Um, of course, we've already heard about a loneliness epidemic in modern society. Loneliness is related to severe health problems, both physical and mental. It's behind most suicides. This should also help us understand how excessive isolation can cause people to become a lot more vulnerable and dependent on the state and easily manipulated. Um, and how about friendships? Some of the social distancing guidelines have been over the top to the nonsensical point of closing beaches, keeping us out of sunshine and salt water, which happened to be destructive to the virus. Um, New York Mayor de Blasio swore he'd arrest people on Coney Island beaches, and the same situation existed in California where people were told to stay indoors. Uh, youth have especially suffered from being cut off from friends. 
But it's interesting, um, I think, how social distancing is suddenly not an issue when it comes to certain officials' tolerance for leftist street theater these days. Uh, next, let's look at the faith communities. Recall another old Marxist slogan that religion is the opiate of the masses. Socialist attacks on religious communities have always been attacks on human relationships. It's not just relationships within the communities and the pastor par parishioner relationship, but they seek to destroy the most elemental relationship of all, the relationship between the individual and God. We've seen a lot of this during the pandemic where certain officials have really pushed the envelope to prevent fellowship of believers. Uh, so, and, and Northam's, uh, uh, Governor Northam's initial cap of 10 people on religious gatherings while allowing hundreds to roam Walmarts and Costcos. Um, you know, the, the list of, uh, uh, of kind of harassment of religious communities uh, goes on. And with the economy, uh, excessive delays in reopening have strong socialist undertones as well. We know that the longer we go with a weakened economy, the harder it'll be to recover. And some would ask us to wait years for a vaccine, which of course would be socioeconomic suicide. So with time, our social bonds as well as economic bonds would dis uh, disintegrate, and of course that's the idea. Um, so, and, and then of course we've got the snitch culture, which has been uh, promoted by Mayor de Blasio, who set up a 311 line so people could report anonymous, anonymously. Governor Ca uh, Newsom of California gave a talk making it clear at the beginning that he depended on social pressure to enforce his guidelines. And of course, you got the weird politics of mask shaming, where those who are not wearing a mask are often labeled as some sort of murderer. So, you know, it, it gets over the top. So we're, we're seeing a lot of undertones of socialism and policies that are being offered uh, by socialists to uh, address the pandemic. If you look at any progressive policy, you'll find it fits a pattern of isolation as well as regulating relationships. National health care, nationalized health care, medals in the doctor-patient relationship, um, the uh, bans on conversion therapy, put big brother uh, in between the therapist and patient. You see meddling in employer-employee relationship with excessive regulation. I mean, you, you can look at any of these policies and you'll find meddling in some kind of relationship. I mean, even the bag tax uh, mer meddles in the merchant-customer relationship. So, um, you know, Pelosi's uh, trillion, multi-trillion dollar uh, socialist wish list that she pushed was jam-packed with policies that invade private life. But in conclusion, I just want to say that, of course, people of goodwill and good faith understand medical necessity of social distancing when it comes to reasonable guidelines and a very dangerous pandemic. The, uh, and, and these are people of good faith and goodwill, but what the problem is when that good faith is abused by elitists in order to consolidate their power over society. So, so if we habitually conform and comply with such socialist tactics and policies, which are really many unconstitutional, will only get more isolation, more scarcity, and more misery. So in the end, we have to demand our First Amendment right to free association in family, in faith communities, and secular communities, because it's our private associations of trust and of love that the hidden sphere of life uh, that are the, the real vaccine for the virus of socialism. And they're under attack for exactly that reason. So I believe that the pandemic and the rioting as well has highlighted the fact that the fuel of socialist power is human isolation and loneliness. And I think we need to talk about it more in those terms. Thank you very much and God bless you. Wow. That was a lot to take in, and we're going to let you digest for just a second. Um, we're going to uh, encourage you to go ahead on our website. Uh, if you're watching that way, there is a form you can submit questions, because I know you've got to have some questions after that talk. It's fantastic. And I love how the family is the solution. Again, we're seeing it's those bonds, those relational bonds that are so 
critical to every problem that we find. Um, but one thing that we do find, and the reason we really want to hit this topic, is we find young people are really getting in inundated with the political correctness that, sh that she talked about, where it becomes this, this cone of silence, and then we think there's this policy shift because they can't say anything and they get told they're wrong. And we find that they're getting fed a lot about socialism. And so at the Family Foundation, we have really worked hard to equip the next generation. And that's what we're doing with our worldview program over the summer. Every week we have a worldview program for college interns called Equip, uh, where we really try to reinforce those bedrock principles that are just so vital uh, for these folks, especially when they're getting bombarded um, by the opposite message when they go to college. And then for a few select folks, we get to take it to another level uh, in a full-bred internship, where we take uh, younger folks under our wings at the Family Foundation all summer long to be part of that program and also kind of understand public policy at a whole nother level. So we're going to go to a little video about our interns. Uh, we're going to take a few minutes, roll a couple of slides, and then circle back with your questions for Stella. God has called me to public policy to defend the unborn and our God given rights. The Family Foundation internship gave me hands on experience in policy where I knew I was actually making a difference. I was excited and honored to work with their team on policy issues at the state level. I absolutely loved my time during the summer and knew I wanted to rejoin the team. That is why I came back to continue a very important fight for our freedoms as a lobbyist during the general session. It was an incredible experience. As a Family Foundation intern, I gained a better understanding of how the nuclear family is vital to the strength of our commonwealth and nation. I saw firsthand how the Family Foundation protects life and strengthens families in Virginia. I knew that I wanted to be a part of it. That's why I came back to be a lobbyist during the General Assembly session and have now joined their full-time staff. I'm Alex, and I was a Family Foundation intern. My name is Evan. My name is Hallie. I'm Trevor. My name is Jordan. My name is Richard. My name is Grace. My name is James, and I was a Family Foundation intern. I'm Mary. I'm Catherine. I'm Erica. I'm Victoria, and I was a Family Foundation intern. I'm Emma Grace, and I'm a future Family Foundation intern. Well, we're thrilled to be back. We got a few questions during the break, so we'll take a couple that we had from you all. Thank you so much for being a part of this and submitting your questions. Stella, one of the questions they had was, how do you see COVID changing America permanently relative to socialism? Which things are gonna harm us for the long term, not just this moment? Oh my, oh, th this is, uh, yeah, th th that's a big question. Um, I think, you know, we, we don't really know what's going to happen. Uh, a lot will depend on the will of those who are willing to fight back uh, and, and to insist on our constitutional right to freedom of association and speech and, um, and to overcome this awful isolation that uh, you know, it, it's, it's been like a, a darkness, a cover of darkness that is um, that, that's kind of descended over the society. But um, go back, the, so how- What things are gonna stick out of this yeah, that may harm us? It does, oh, that may harm us. Oh yeah, no. Sort of towards uh, socialism, you know? Yeah, yeah, no, if, if it turns out that, uh, you know, you know, as a result of the the lockdowns, if they become kind of a habitual response, then you end up with a more powerful government, a bigger government, and of course, that's what socialism is about. Um, well, as I said, too much power in the hands of too few people, and um, you know, those 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 few people need to be, you know, understand checks and balances and be put in their place. Yeah, I do think people are beginning to see that governors can have a lot of power and attempt to, in these crisis moments, capture so much authority. And so we do hope the courts obviously check that to keep our system in check because we know people in power love power. Oh, well, and there, there one ray of hope, though, in response to that question is, um, in Stanton, uh, two weeks ago, I think it was, mm -hmm. they had an election for town council, and uh, you know, which had been very, very, uh, shall we say, progressive oriented for yeah. a long time. And they were, I think there were four who were up for re-election, and uh, compared to 2016 when they were elected, 
uh, when there were 7,000 votes. This time there were 17,000. And, and, and they put these progressives, three of them anyway, out. Oh, uh, that's it was encouraging. astonishing yeah. uh, what happened. So we have to understand the importance of local uh, officials, local Absolutely. government. It starts down there. Absolutely. Um, just maybe one more question. One thing that I read an article about was just sort of our church is going to suffer from people getting used to online church, and, mm -hmm. and we miss that connection with each other, which is deeply concerning. But in the connection to, to socialism, we had one question that said, is there anything Christian about socialism, right? So I think Christians get told that's the nice thing to do. Well, sure, that's the cover story. I mean, you've always got to have a cover story when you're going for a power grab. And the cover story with socialism is, you know, social and economic justice. I mean, if you study Soviet history, that, that pretty much clarifies what happens when you put too much power in the hands of too few people. I mean, yes, you, you build up safety nets, but you never should give up the checks and balances on power because as, well, I guess, the Lord Act and um, Adage, power corrupts and absolute power, you know, corrupts absolutely. So, um, you know, you just, uh, sure, I mean, just don't swallow the bait. It's a bait and switch. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much. We don't have a time for a ton of questions, but we really appreciate you being here. And thank we just, you. I mean, never more relevant um, is this idea of looking at power and how is it being appropriated in this moment of crisis. Um, next, we're excited to look at the issue of life. Uh, deep conversations happening around the issue of life. And to take them on, we're going to hear from RJ Snell. RJ uh, is both with the Witherspoon Institute. That's how a lot of folks know him. He's also with Culture for life and uh, just has some really powerful thoughts. We had to catch him before he went out on vacation, so you'll, you'll see it was a, a pre-recorded uh, video message. But wow, what thoughts he's going to share about whether our society is where it needs to be when pandemics hit, when we have to battle with the questions of life. Hello, good day to everyone. I wish I could be with you, um, but this will have to do for the occasion. And I'll send you all my greetings from Princeton, New Jersey, even though I wish we were together in person. My name is RJ Snell. I'm the Director of Academic Programs at the Witherspoon Institute in Princeton, uh, as well as a Senior Fellow at the Culture of Life Institute and the Culture of Life Foundation. I give my thanks to the Family Foundation, not only for all of their good work, uh, supporting family and family-friendly policies, uh, but also for inviting me here this evening. And I give my thanks to all of you for, for signing in and listening. Very good to be with you. Just as you can tell a good friend when the chips are down, the kind of friend you can call when you're in trouble or in the middle of the night, so you can tell a lot about a society when it's in crisis, when there's a bit of shock. When there's a shock or even some sort of external condition, we can be brought into a clear moment of sight, a moment of clarity to see what's really going on in our society. Well, as it ha turns out, we actually are in something of a shock. There are lockdowns and quarantines, and there have been deaths. And there's a shock to the economy. Businesses are closed. Schools are closed. Uh, even a few parents have discovered that homeschooling itself is something of a shock, and a shock devoutly to be avoided, perhaps. Now, of course, while reasonable people can, can and do disagree about what makes for good policy, how should we have handled the crisis? Should there have been lockdowns? Should the lockdowns be opened up or extended? Reasonable people can disagree about those sorts of things. But what should be clear to us all is that underlying the manifestations of the crisis are deeper moments of cultural disease and unrest. And that's what I'd like to spend a few moments thinking about with, with you this evening. What does the crisis in its current mode reveal about our commitment to the culture of life and maybe even some of the weaknesses in that culture in our contemporary society? A few examples. First, it was very surprising um, when the first reports or warnings of shortages were occurring. I'm thinking here of ventilators and personal protective equipment. It was very surprising to me to see how quickly and how suddenly Certain reputable institutions released triage statements or guidelines for how to provide medical care under conditions of shortage, and how many of those new guidelines violated basic and ancient norms about the treatment of the elderly or the disabled. 
as if those who were cognitively or physically disabled could be set to the side, or as if those who were elderly, perhaps with just a few years left to live under normal conditions, were presumed to be treated last, to not be given the ventilators. And this was guidance that was given from reputable and established organizations. That's one symptom. Second, the conversation about vaccines. It's surprising to some of us what a lack of concern there is about vaccines which are developed from descendant cells gained or gathered from aborted fetal remains even when there are perfectly acceptable, moral and medically acceptable alternatives, but to ask questions or to raise concerns about those vaccines developed from aborted fetal tissue is outside of the pale of concern for many. That's another symptom. Or third, what about the callousness that we've seen among some, thankfully not all, about those who are elderly or disabled as they come near to death from COVID or perhaps have died? Perhaps some of you have heard the phrase, not a, very, uh, not a very friendly one, about the boomer remover. The novel coronavirus is the boomer remover, which can finally remove the unwanted segments of society. That's a genuinely callous statement. Or I've read reports recently of individuals who, now that we know more about the death rates and have discovered that a wide percentage of those who have passed away from COVID-19 turn out to be elderly or oftentimes are already in nursing homes or elder care facilities. And I've read many reports of people discounting those deaths because, quote unquote, these people had not long to live anyway. As if someone who was young mattered more than someone who was old. Someone who was healthy and hearty and hale mattered more than someone who suffered from comorbidities and was perhaps already ill from other conditions. That's a symptom, something to notice. Or fourth, what about the idea so prevalent throughout the coronavirus, especially in the early days when the lockdowns were commencing and governors were releasing, releasing excuse me, guidelines about businesses being closed, churches being closed, schools being closed, many forms of ordinary medical treatment being made unavailable, that nonetheless abortion clinics were open, ready for business, and that abortion was deemed to be essential medical care. For many in our society, abortion seems almost tantamount to a sacrament. The churches were closed, you couldn't get a real sacrament, but abortion, the quasi-sacrament of some, was readily available. In fact, we discovered that there were some clinics which provided ordinary medical care, which were forbidden from doing so, and those very same medical clinics were permitted or were open for no other reason than to provide abortion. There were reports from Britain, for, uh, for, as another example, of uh, proposals to mail directly to homes abortifacients, sometimes without the need to consult a medical professional beforehand. And there were many reports of regulations for things like ordinary health care or additional medical staff being on, uh, on call for abortion clinics, regulations being proposed to set those to the side. That's a remarkable symptom at a moment when so much is closed that abortion is open for business and essential. Now, those four symptoms all reveal to me that the sanctity of life ethic, the ethic which says that each human life has value and that each human life has equal value. In the famous words of Dr. Seuss, a person is a person no matter how small, or a person is a person no matter how old or vulnerable or ill or capable or disabled. That ethic, the ethic of the sanctity of life, is hardly cherished, hardly understood, and hardly valued by many in our society. Replacing the ethic of sanctity or the sanctity of life ethic is instead a more hard-hearted utilitarianism. One counts up the costs, one counts up the value of a human life, and some are worth more than others because of their ability to produce, their ability to consume, their age, their health, their demographic. Replacing the sanctity of life is an ethic which is not transcendent. It does not view all lives as being held in the care of an ever-loving God, nor created in the image of God. Now, it's not really those symptoms which we saw manifested. We also noted in the current uh, moment that certain institutions were not understood or valued, perhaps as they ought to have been. For instance, the church. It was very clear that the church was quickly sidelined, often in arbitrary ways. 
How strange was it that you could go with hundreds or dozens at least to your local home hardware store to provide goods for your garden or home, whereas the church was not able to have 10 or 15 in for morning prayer? Why was that? And why did so many religious leaders go silently into that good night and not offer more of a resistance or at least an account of why worship is not only essential, but indeed something which the human being needs primarily to flourish? And what about the institution of the family? Already uh, before the current pandemic, many social commentators were noting what they called a pandemic of loneliness or an epidemic of loneliness, that many, many Americans were alone. Now, it makes sense in a mobile culture like our own that people would suffer from loneliness. The young person goes to college in a town far away from home, and then she gets a job, her first job, in a city far removed from her parents, and then she gets a second job and moves again. Those conditions are ripe for people being lonely, and that makes good sense. On the other hand, what we've discovered is that many people in our society have not just the momentary loneliness of moving to a new city or a new town, but they are profoundly alone that it is not merely the uh, slogan of being alone together, but that they are entirely alone. Marriage is in decline in our society. We have the lowest recorded rates of marriage in our history. We're also not in a baby boom, but a baby slump. We have the lowest rates of childbirth for decades. Many are alone, and they view themselves increasingly as isolated individuals, not beholden to or belonging in thick networks to anyone. They're not alone together, they're just alone. Now those are symptoms. What is the underlying cause? What do these symptoms reveal to us about our society? Well, I think it reveals that this is about more than politics. This is not just about the next election cycle or the courts. It is instead a much deeper and more profound struggle or contest about what it means to be a human being, the value of being a human, those institutions in which human beings flourish and live and move and have their being, the meaning of hope of being a human. It's a struggle over the very and fundamental meaning of being a human being. Some years ago now, the sociologist Philip Reef noted that there was an enormous transition of culture going on in the West. As he accounted for it, the older culture was one which understood the world and the universe to be governed by the Logos, that the world was created it was governed providentially, and it was a universe of order, purpose, and value. In the words of Genesis 1, it was good and very good because it was sustained by a transcendent and good being who cared very much about that world. The new culture, says Reef, is a world of radical skepticism, and it defines itself not by so much what it builds up, but as what it takes down or negates. It defines itself essentially as negating the older culture. This is a world which is readily on display in many schools and universities. It's a world of critique and deconstruction. It unmasks. It tears down and takes apart. It reveals the nakedness of the fathers and the sins of the heroes. It does not delight in building, but it delights in taking down. It is, in Reef's terms, not so much a culture as an anti-culture. And its proponents, according to Reef, are, in a wonderful line, virtuosi of decreation. Now, a major target of these virtuosi of decreation is the family. The family is that institution which shows us that we fundamentally belong. One of the fundamental needs of each and every human being is to belong, to have a sense of being placed in the middle of a story that matters to them and that makes them matter. And family does this, oftentimes in ways that you don't wish. You wish you sometimes did not belong to this particular family with that particular uncle. Some of you nod your heads because you know that you are that uncle and wish you were not. Family reveals that there is a story which precedes us. There's a story of grandmothers and great-grandfathers and great-great-grandmothers, and that we have not only a place in that story, but that story makes claims upon us. We have duties to it. I remember being told as a young man that I got to get to my studies because my grandmother had worked so that I would have opportunities that she never had, and so I better best get to my books, young man. A family which I did not choose for myself thus made claims upon me. I had responsibilities to it. Family also not only gives us a past, but a future. When we have family, we build for the future. We invest. 
We plant trees that we will never enjoy the shade of, knowing that generations yet to come will enjoy their shade. That is a story of identity. It gives us norms. It gives us virtues. It makes us industrious, thrifty, kind. It makes us sacrifice ourselves. It gives us, in other words, a story of piety and reverence. Family is essentially tied to a religious view of the world. Now, I don't mean by that merely the sociological fact that religious people tend to have families and that people who have families tend to be more religious. I mean something more than that. I mean this. Family is itself a deep education in tradition. That something is given to you, handed to you. The Latin word for tradition just means to hand on or to be handed to. You are handed a responsibility. It is not of your own creation. And this reality which you did not create makes claims upon you. Family, in other words, reveals in a profound and concrete way, right at the most intimate experiences of our life, the metaphysics of creation. It is no accident that in the Hebrew scriptures, when God decides to create a new way and educate a new man into a new law, I mean here Abraham, that the education he gives Abraham is so much about family. Now, if you remember the story, Abraham has left his father behind. He's left a brother who has passed away behind. And he's also without religion. There's Talmudic stories that Abraham's father was a maker of idols. He had a craft shop, a pottery shop. And that Abraham has recognized the falsity of the idols, and he smashes the idols in his father's workshop and departs. Now, in the interpretation of Leon Cass, uh, in, his in his commentary in the book of Genesis, he describes Abraham thus as fatherless himself, without tradition, without belonging. And it is this fatherless, religionless man that God chooses to educate into a new way. And the new way that God chooses to educate Abraham into is very much an education into family, into being a husband and into being a father. If you recall the story, you know how often Abraham, afraid of for his own life, sacrifices Sarah into the harem of someone else. God needs to teach Abraham about the sacredness of marriage. It's also, of course, a story about the covenant of children, about the hope of ancestors as numerous as the stars, and the waiting, long waiting for a child. You'll recall that Abraham is faithless at one point to the covenant and chooses to have a child wrongly because he does not believe in the covenantal promise. And so the education of Father Abraham, in the words of that song that I learned in Sunday school about Father Abraham, the education of Father Abraham is an education into being a father and a husband. It's an education into God's new way, where God's new way of law and order and covenant, what will eventually be Sinai and the commandments and, the pe and his people, is an education into a way of more dignity than known before, more responsibility than known before more hope than known before, because an education into the covenant of family and in belonging. And it gave us not just tradition, but the Abrahamic tradition, which has meant so much to so many in the West. Family reveals the metaphysics of a providentially created order. And it's why revolutionaries are always seeking to bring family apart, because bringing family apart is the only real way to end tradition. It is the most visceral way to end the feeling of belonging and the piety that comes with belonging. Revolutionaries hope in the end to have individuals be rootless, alone, self-seeking, with nothing to commit themselves to other than the immediate and the visible. The ending of family, thus, is the ending of transcendence. It is the ending of concerns for religion. It is the ending of concerns for the sanctity of life, which depends upon more than the immediate in the moment. Now, it seems clear to many of us that the shocks that we've underwent in the last few weeks and months are not yet over, that more shocks are yet to come. We don't know what will happen with the economy. We don't know what will happen with employment. Many of the students that I work with are unsure what will happen in the fall when it comes to college and schools. But beyond those moments, which are real shocks and are real moments of concern, the shock reveals that the culture of life, that an ethic of the sanctity of life, the worth of babies, the worth of the elderly, the worth of the vulnerable, that that ethic, that culture of life is not held in esteem by as many as we might wish. 
It's revealed that the freedom of worship is not held in high, as high esteem as many of us would wish. And it reveals that so much of our common life depends upon the family. And on that front, the family is in decline. And as the family declines, so too, unfortunately, does the culture. A philosopher who I like very much has this, I think, quote-worthy quip. He says that a culture in decline digs its grave with relentless consistency. A culture in decline digs its grave with relentless consistency. People like us, however, are people of a culture of life. We're a people of life and new life and life abundant. We are not people of death. We are not people of the culture of death. And so we hope for more and we have hope that there can be more. The work of organizations like the Family Foundation matters so much, not just for the moment, but for generations yet to come. Earlier, I made reference to the person of family plants trees and builds investments for future generations that he or she will never know and will never enjoy the shade of that tree or the benefits of those investments. Organizations like the Family Foundation build for generations yet to come. They have my thanks for all of their work. I'm grateful to them for letting me join you this evening. And I offer my thanks to all of you for your support of the Foundation and indeed of all its good work. Thank you very much. And to digest this amazing uh, talk we just got by RJ Snell, I thought I'd bring up back up with Candy, uh, Josh Hetzler, who's the head of our uh, legislative, he's our legislative counsel at the Family Foundation. Uh, an awesome talk just about uh, kind of an overarching how our society's faring, I guess, on the life and family question. What was your key takeaway, Josh? What did you get out of that? Well, that's a, a, a tough question, really, because he said so many things worth commenting on. He was really spot on. And, you know, one of the things that, that I picked up on, I think probably because I realized how much I took it for granted, uh, and it was when he was talking about the value of, of family and the sense of belonging that it brings. Um, and um, what was I saying? Oh, and, and, the, and, and he went on to talk about uh, identity um, Goodness, I'm blanking. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it was fantastic. Do you want to share a takeaway, Candy? I mean, maybe anything yeah, you... I love, I love the point you're making, Josh, just um, that, you know, he reminds us what we take for granted, and COVID-19 has done such a good job of, I don't want to say good about anything related to that, but reminding us what it is that keeps the society together. We've had to relook at that, and I really resonated really powerfully with a lot of his points because as you guys know, I recently did this op-ed in The Federalist where I talked about this whole, it feels like just this whole cognitive dissonance that we're experiencing in our nation right now on the whole life issue. Because um, on one hand, you've got Americans, a vast majority of Americans, um, just willing to sacrifice so much extreme sacrifices to their livelihood to protect the people next to them, to save the lives of people we love, our neighbors, our colleagues. Um, so we've all united together in that way to protect life as Americans. You know, we even had government officials like the New York governor, Cuomo, Governor Cuomo, saying that human life is, you know, is not disposable. You cannot put a dollar on human life. Um, but at the same time, this is the same governor that signed a law basically allowing abortion up to the point of birth. Um, you know, and, and his state lit up the World Trade Center in celebration of that, you know? And so I'm just wondering, wh where are we going to, where, how's that going to shape out when we walk out of this COVID thing, when we start walking out of this? Is, is the fact that we had to make hard decisions about the, the length we're willing to go to to protect others going to open up more conversation for life? Or is the abortion community still going to have that stronghold in our policies? Um, you know, because he talked about also just with this contradiction in our society right now, um, abortion clinics being treated as essential and even sacred, but churches at the bottom of that. So, you know, how is that going to shape out? I think a lot of it comes is going to go back to us and whether we're willing to speak out. Yeah, absolutely. I, yeah, I, I think I remember what <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, but in talking about the context of a family and belonging, just how important that is for individuals. And that uh, really helps us understand our core identity. One of the things he, he mentioned was uh, that we're, there's this uh, almost a philosophical question of what it means to be a human being. 
And uh, we're seeing that play out in a number of ways. One of the ways with transgenderism, and we really have a crisis uh, of identity. But, and, and so I, I just, I appreciated what he said about family and the sense of belonging because of just how really critical that is and we don't think about it all that much. It's why we put so much value in adoption, uh, for example, because, you know, kids really need that. Um, so yeah. you know, that was one of the takeaways. Maybe any one positive thing that we can sort of, he mentioned sort of we're sick as a society. I mean, he kind of said, like, these are the symptoms of our sickness. Any, any one thing maybe we could take away as a to-do or a, you know, a suggestion of how we move forward? Well, yeah, as I'm talking about conversations, what, what is the conversation coming as we make steps, hopefully soon, coming out of COVID-19? Where are we gonna be at as a society about life? I think it's gonna come down to you and me and the church awakening and really believers being willing to be countercultural and speak life into this culture, the inherent value of life. I mean, we see the results of the degradation of life with what's going on in our country. It just feels like it's being torn apart right now. And we gotta have the boldness to speak the life that's in us from Jesus into that. The truth and grace, I mean, I really do not see a lot of hope outside of the church waking up, each person being willing to be countercultural where they're at and speak up on these issues. And, and I think we can do it, but boy, are we sure are at a key moment. Absolutely. Well, I, just for time's sake to keep moving, we'll, we'll probably have to leave it on that note. Uh, but one of the key things the Family Foundation is doing to constantly push our society to value human life, to constantly be, be drawing attention is the Virginia March for Life. We're thrilled two years ago that we got to uh, initiate the first state-based march here in Virginia, and we've had just thousands show up each year, rain or shine, uh, to be part of that effort, to be part of making their voices heard so that our legislature knows there are thousands that are saying we must do more for the unborn. So we're gonna show you a little clip uh, just so you get a feel of the March for Life in Virginia. Super excited about the next portion of this event today. Uh, a friend to the Family Foundation for a long time. Uh, we're excited now to be able to, to, to join live, but not in person. I don't know how that goes, but uh, to be able to share with you uh, our friend out at the Colson Center. Colson Center has just been such a tremendous gift to the conservative movement, tackling the issues of culture, having the real dialogues. Uh, if you do not get their breakpoint, you are missing out. Um, if you have not thought about being a Colson Fellow, you know, they have just fantastic programming 
to make us think a little deeper about these issues, to make us um, really take head on everything that is happening in our day at our moment with the things that matter. I want to remind you at this moment that you are, if you're watching this on the, on the website, you have that spot where you can submit questions. We're going to do a couple questions if, if technology lets us work well. Uh, we're going to do a couple questions back at John after he shares some comments with us. I would also mention he is the author of many books, but most recently, along with uh, Brett Kunkel, he is the author of a book called A Student's Guide to Culture, something that we think is tremendously important. I was mentioning that that equip program that we run, that worldview program. Uh, here's my plug that his co-author is actually going to be the very first speaker of our equip program this summer for our college interns. Uh, so we appreciate that not only are they speaking to the issues, but they're gearing it in many cases towards the generation that needs to hear it the most. So I'm going to turn it over to you, John. Thanks so much for being here. Hey, uh, thanks so much, Victoria. It's great to see you. Great to be with all of uh, your friends and supporters and uh, co-laborers there in the state of Virginia. I grew up in Virginia. I now live in Colorado, so I won the bet and got to move out here. But I uh, absolutely uh, love Virginia and know that the last several years in particular in the state has been uniquely challenging uh, as the, uh, you know, kind of Virginia has become similar to states like Michigan or Illinois, where you have, you know, kind of a big kind of central urban area that's determining so much for the rest of the state. And, and that's been a challenge that's become uh, more obvious even in the last couple weeks as we've all been uh, on uh, trying to navigate this coronavirus challenge. And you have policies that work for urban areas that are, you know, being Im imposed on other areas and, and all kinds of things. So a lot of my childhood friends, my family, uh, a lot of, uh, in fact, my pastors growing up, some of my friends actually became pastors, uh, which is a little bit scary. Uh, they all, um, you know, are, are wrestling with these same sorts of questions that Christians really are everywhere. Um, and, and then you put all that into the context of what we watched this past weekend unfold. Uh, you know, I, I was struck by this. Uh, what, what a strange weekend when on Saturday we were able to see together uh, one of the pinnacles of human achievement, right? Flight into space. Uh, and to see it done the particular way that it was, which is really amazing uh, that a private company working uh, with the government and, and being able to do this for the first time out of the U.S. in nine years and, and all kinds of things going along with it. And, and we cheered and we should have cheered because it's an amazing thing. And yet, and yet, at the same time, just 12 hours before, um, uh, there was a looting and burning in cities all across America. And of course, 12 hours later, the same thing. And we're probably going to see this now for several days. And, and, and isn't that really um, a reminder that our greatest scientific achievements, our most amazing technological capabilities, I mean, we can fly to space. We can defy gravity. We can talk to people instantly, you know, like we're doing right now, not even being in the same place. Uh, and I can even, you know, talk to people around the world. I mean, we have amazing technological capability. It's, it's quite possible we'll come up with some sort of vaccine or some sort of treatment for this pandemic and the next one and the next one. We have that sort of capability. And yet the things that so deeply divide us, our technology and our science can't handle it. The things that so deeply divide us, uh, our deepest human problems, um, well, it, it, we're no closer to fixing those uh, than uh, at any other generation that's ever lived. Um, of course, the fear is, is that we have technologies that allow us to, um, let's say, uh, act on our divisive impulses in more efficient and more violent ways than ever before. So that's where we're at. I, I, I saw a meme this morning. Of course, memes are not the great, greatest place to get your theologies. But I saw a meme this morning that said, uh, you know, just here's your friendly reminder that the Chinese saying, may you live in interesting times, is a curse, not a blessing. <laughs> and so here we are uh, living in what many would call interesting times um, and challenging times. I, I, I want to remind us whenever I think about uh, culture, um, whenever we talk about the challenges of our moment, uh, we as Christians always have to say something more. Uh, 
Uh, we shouldn't say anything less, and I'll talk about that in just a second. We shouldn't sidestep the challenges of our moment. We shouldn't hide from them. We shouldn't pretend like they don't matter. Uh, we shouldn't pretend like there's nothing we can do. We shouldn't throw our hands up in despair. Uh, but what we must say is in the face of all of this is what Christians in every generation have always said, which is Christ is risen. So no matter uh, what happens in the next 48 hours in reaction to this this uh, horrible death of, of, of George Floyd in Minneapolis and how it continues to spread across America, no matter what we say about that, we must always say Christ is risen. And that that is the thing, that is the reality, that's the truth that's guiding what we think. I think we've seen wonderful glimpses of this over the last several weeks during the coronavirus, where uh, we, we see that the, this, this reality that Christians are not quarantined from service, that like generations before us, that we might do it in a more health conscious way. Uh, run into the plague and not away from it, because that's what Christians have always done. That's what we do uh, well. And uh, I, I think we're seeing opportunities to do this um, at, at, at a remarkable, uh, re remarkable uh, level. Um, isn't it a, an amazing thing to consider that um, churches everywhere were able to pivot so quickly? And to use technology, the thing that in our culture is so often separating us from each other and separating us from our own families and actually use that in, in new ways. Um, that's really a remarkable ac accomplishment for, for, from, from the church. And to see the church being able to um, reach out and in so many ways, by the way, work with government authorities. Uh, I think one of the realities I, 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 I uh, we've been talking a lot about this on our breakpoint commentaries, uh, Victoria, that uh, one of the things that's that's happening right now uh, through the coronavirus. And I think, by the way, it's also true with what we have seen this weekend is that these are incidents not so much creating our issues as they are revealing our issues. Mm -hmm. In other words, America suffers from an awful lot of pre-existing conditions. And um, one of those pre-existing conditions has been a challenge for the church. And that is how quickly the church was put into the category of non-essential. Mm -hmm. uh, how quickly, by the way, workers were put into the category of non-essential. I mean, that's a real issue. I mean, can you, who, uh, you know, the, 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 the biblical vision of human activity and human work is that it is created by God and blessed by God as part of our calling and that the work of our hands matters to God. And if that's the case, no one should grab onto or embrace the adjective non-essential. And good heavens, when it comes to church, there's no such thing as a non-essential church. Church is essential, but we do live in a culture that sees church as being non-essential. Uh, we have um, government officials that really believed that the church was non-essential, that it's an activity. It's a, as, as, as Professor Robbie George put it to me in one of our interviews that we did together during this time, that it's a hobby, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, going bowling or, you know, playing cards or whatever, uh, knitting or something like that, that, oh yeah, and on Sundays I go to church and that's what I do and it's my hobby, as opposed to the difference between seeing the world uh, as one created by God into which uh, we're responsible and seeing the world just completely horizontally uh, as if it's, you know, the government's relationship to us is that is all that matters. And I think having the church respond the way that it has and keep people connected through technology and, 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 and also being able to flex and to adjust. And we're going to see that again. I, I've worked with a bunch of pastors over the last couple of weeks and, and I, uh, I think we all agree that if you thought shutting down churches was hard, opening them back up is going to be even more difficult. And, uh, and to do that in a way that makes everybody happy. Good heavens, we can't even pick, you know, carpet color in a way that makes everybody happy. Uh, to, be able to, to, to be able to handle this is going to be a real, real challenge. But, but you know, here's, here's what we know, uh, that Jesus said the gates of hell cannot stand against the church. Um, the church is going to make it. The church needs to make it. Let me put it a different way. Um, what we saw this weekend tells us that the world needs the church because the world certainly has no other solutions or strategies for the things that are really just tearing us apart from the inside. Um, I think um, 
we're going to see that in days to come. Let me tell you something else, too, that's been encouraging uh, to me uh, as well during this time. And I think it's so critical to the work, Victoria, that you do and the Family Foundation of Virginia does is support the work of educational freedom and educational choice. Um, you know, as Oprah said a couple weeks ago, you know, you get to homeschool and you get to homeschool and you get to homeschool. Everybody gets to homeschool. <laughs> and you're, you're seeing now the results of that. But, you know, the, 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 the ability that was already in place uh, across uh, cities across America, we certainly have it here in Colorado Springs, but I know in a lot of ways in Virginia you do as well, is the educational innovation. This is something that isn't uniquely Christian, but it's primarily Christian. Whenever, wherever Christians have spread anywhere that they've gone, in any town, any cultural setting, any context, education has gone along uh, because Christians believe that to know stuff about the world is to know the mind of God. That's a, a rough uh, kind of paraphrase of Johannes Kepler, um, that, that the world is knowable and that we can acquire truth, and that God has given us minds in which to do this. And when we do it, we glorify him. I mean, what a vision for education. And uh, that's a lot better than, uh, you know, the vision that so often dominates our culture, which is, um, you know, uh, you, you go to school to get a job, to make money, to buy stuff, to die, you know, and that, uh, that's kind of what, really what it's all about. There's a much bigger vision in the Christian frame of reference, uh, which is why, again, the world needs Christians to be Christians, or as Chuck Colson would say, the church to be the church. And we've seen this in the, the, the realm of education. Uh, we've seen um, uh, people be able to flex and then offer amazing resources to families that are at home. And I think uh, in many, many more ways, this is going to have to be protected because the old models are going to break down. Um, we already know the old model has been breaking down in terms of re return on investment, right? The traditional model that if you go to school, you get a job and you make this much money and you can pay off all this debt. And that's not working nearly as well as it used to if it's working at all. Not to mention the indoctrination on new ideas. I know that's an issue you guys have been up front and center on, Victoria, there in Virginia. As, again, Northern Virginia leads the rest of the state, sometimes in not such great ways, in sex education. Um, and make no mistake about it, sex education today um, is in, not just an education about whether certain sexual activities are right and wrong. It's a re-education about what it means to be human. It's, it's as deep as it gets. It's, uh, it's, it's taking something that is an activity of human beings and turning it into an identity in such a way as to violate people. Uh, I think in many ways, sex education that gets advanced, certainly what we fought against here in Colorado became child abuse. I mean, I don't know how else to say mm -hmm. it. I think it's abusive to children. And you guys fought the same thing. And man, what, what is needed is that for the church to provide an alternative. And I think increasingly people are going to see what the alternatives uh, are. Uh, we also know that, man, we can't, we can't back down on this one at all. We've all watched, uh, well, I hope you, you, you've all watched um, as uh, one of uh, Harvard University's uh, research professors on this have posited these terrible articles saying that homeschooling is abusive and, 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 and so on, and that the government needs to oversee all of these areas. This is a real challenge. And one of the reasons why the work that you do is so absolutely important is you know uh, that, you know, the, the work of the, of the family foundation there is, is to really keep uh, government at bay where it doesn't belong. I, mean, I, don't want, I don't know if that sounds bad, but that's a really important thing that the government's really good at some things and really not good at other things. And when the government steps in where it doesn't belong, it causes a lot of, a lot of issues. And I'm telling you, um, there, there's a whole set of issues in which if the church went away, it would be a disaster and education is absolutely one of them. And what a, what a great thing that, that so many Christians were able to show their ability to flex and the ability to pivot and the ability to continue to offer the right things uh, at this time and place, despite the pandemic, despite the challenges that, that, that we faced. Um, look, the, the, the other thing that I think has been remarkable and is going to be a, a, an ongoing need uh, as we come out of this lockdown um, and also as we face uh, kind of the growing frustration is um, 
is, 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 uh, well, let me say two things just quickly here and, and then we can take maybe some questions, Victoria, if you'd like, uh, let me give you two things. The, the first thing that I think is really important to think about is that we have already been a culture struggling with what many people have called deaths from despair. Uh, this is the loneliness. I know, um, the 81 highway is often called the, uh, what is it called? The, uh, opioid, uh, highway, highway. Mm-hmm. Um, so people have written about that. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, and I, you know, and I know exactly what they're talking about having grown up kind of at, right when the opioid addiction was just trying to mm-hmm. take off, but we're also an isolated fo- uh, c- community, uh, or sorry, we're often isolated communities and isolated individuals and our technologies, which can connect us can also isolate us. And so we've had an uptick prior pre-existing condition of addiction, of overdoses and of suicides. And we just took that context and told everyone, stay at home. Um, We are going to see the despair uh, wrought on individuals like this. And this is why what else is going to bring together little communities within communities like the church? Mm -hmm. What else is there? Shopping malls can't do this. You know, state state legislative committees can't do this. Um, The church does this. You know, we, we are a nation that, as uh, Robert Putnam wrote a long time ago, bowls alone. You know, more Americans bowl, but fewer join bowling leagues. But what still has a presence is the church. And the church is going to have to address this epidemic of loneliness that I think really has just gotten worse. And then finally, I'll say this. What a, what a wonderful opportunity that the church has right now to answer the deepest questions that the human heart asks. Right now, we have a world, uh, uh, a, a country screaming for justice. And, um, you know, it, it's interesting. We were talking about this within our team this morning, is that everything that we have seen this weekend reveals things about the human condition. First of all, why do we even expect justice to be available in the universe. You know, if the, if the world is the product of r- random evolutionary, mindless, godless, you know, forces of natural selection, then justice is it the story of the world. Survival of the fittest is, story, is the story of the world. And there's really nothing else you can point to. But we all, as C.S. Lewis said, expect justice to be in the world. And if you ever meet someone who says, oh, there's no such thing as right and wrong, Lewis said, just cut him off in line. And he'll tell you, you shouldn't have done that. And that's really where it comes from. So we're seeing now this bubbling up, this cry for justice, which is pointing to something true about the world, that we do live in a universe with moral norms. We do live in a universe where justice is available. And then also uh, what we also know to be true uh, about uh, the human person, that we know that the universe should be otherwise. All right. But why should we have that expectation at all? We think that the universe should be fixed, but why should we have that expectation at all? Uh, It's because there was a way that the universe was and something's gone wrong. And here we are uh, now in Christ with the ability to make all things new. Um, I I, I was struck this week in Victoria and I'll close with this um, is, is, is uh, in many traditions, this was the remembrance of Pentecost when Jesus Christ uh, promised in, uh, in the Last Supper discourse to send the Holy Spirit. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 2, sent the Holy Spirit. And you have this remarkable scene uh, there as he, as the disciples start preaching, having been filled by the Holy Spirit, of people across language barriers and tribes hearing uh, him, hearing this message of salvation and repentance. And what a remarkable thing, because if you actually see the Bible as a whole story, then you'll know that what that was, was in a very real sense, a reversal of Babel. Uh, there at Babel, um, you have uh, one world after the flood, disobeying God's command to spread out over. So God disperses them. And now we have every tongue, tribe, nation, and language. And we know hatred and division and brokenness starts in the garden. But there's a new level of national brokenness and national division. And even in the biblical story, nation versus nation war, that pops up and emerges right there at the Tower of Babel. And we've been dealing with it ever since. And in a very real way, what we saw this past weekend in cities across America was the result of Babel. 
And yet, what does the, the what does the scripture tell us that we have been given the Holy Spirit? And somehow Jesus said, it's better that I go away and send you the Holy Spirit. I have no idea how it's better to have the Holy Spirit than Jesus himself. But that's what Jesus said. And so we have this in the very next, the very, very next um, opportunity uh, that, that the, the disciples have to share the gospel. That in a sense, Babel is reversed, but not fully. But it's a foretaste of what you read in the new heavens and new earth. John writes about it in Revelation 7. Every tongue tribe, nation, and language dressed in white before the throne of God, worshiping the Father and the Son. And and, and that's really the promise that we have, uh, that nowhere, that's not available anywhere else. Hope, real hope, that Christ is risen and that he's given us the Holy Spirit uh, that can overcome all kinds of boundaries. So thanks, Victoria. It's so good to be with you um, for, for this event. I'm such a big fan of what you guys do. Well, thank you so much. You've given us so much to think about uh, here with this talk. Uh, you know, I, I was reflecting on your comments about justice and this expectation that we ha- that we believe there should be justice. And I think back to sort of Romans, what's written on our hearts, right? Like mm-hmm. we are created knowing there's a God and, and, you know, we can deny that. And we do a lot of things to decondition ourselves to sort of to, to sort of numb that in our society. But the reality is when, when, when injustice occurs, it fires up, I think, that what we innately know because God wrote it on our hearts. Oh, that's absolutely right. And, but it also points to something else, is that, that the level of injustice, not only the sense of justice, but the source of injustice comes from the human heart. Um, right. I have been for the last three years reading and rereading and rereading Alexander Solzhenitsyn's speech at Harvard University, which I think is a remarkable account and prediction of the sort of brokenness he saw coming to Western civilization. But in another place, he said something that was really interesting, and it should inform how we look at this situation. He said, if only there were those bad people somewhere and you could just like take them, gather them up and get rid of them and fix the world. He said, but the problem is the line of good and evil does not run between nations, does not run between races. It runs down the middle of the human heart. And um, that is also why what you guys do is so important, right? Even though you're involved in the political space, the worst mistake we can make is to think that, well, maybe our science and technology can't get us there, but our politics can. If only the right guy in the right office does the right thing, then therefore, and you know what? This is a problem of the human heart. And one of the worst things that happens is when the government tries to, to recondition the human heart. Man, you want you want the list of things that went wrong in the 20th century? They all basically go back to that one. And what you guys often do is create elbow room for civil society, for the church, for the home, for, for local institutions and organizations to do their very good work without government interference because they can accomplish things that the government cannot. And that sort of uh, elbow room is so vital. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned uh, one of the key things I took away from your earlier talk was just the church being this fundamental community that we're still doing community. And it's so important. And we, we kind of see on the left, there's almost been a replacement of that in politics, which becomes oh, very, yeah. very unhealthy very, very quickly. Uh, do you think in, in uh, you know, one of the questions we got was sort of con- connected to, are people going to get comfortable doing online church and are we going to lose that? Are we really distinguishing what really makes a community? I mean, we're doing the best we can to, to gather and connect. Are people going to, do we feel like churches are going to come back and be healthy and vibrant because we know what we're missing or are we thinking that we're replacing it with technology? Oh man, how many things are loaded in that question? Uh, <laughs> Let, let me start here. Uh, there's an assumption that maybe what we were doing before with he- was healthy and vibrant, and maybe that isn't necessarily mm-hmm. the case. So maybe this is a way that certain things are being corrected. So, for example, if, uh, if you were as a Christian used to going and kind of watching a video screen for church, then it's probably not that big of a change for you to stay at home. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm not against video churches or anything like that. Mm-hmm. I'm just saying that that's really not the church being the church. That's that's an observation rather than a participation. 
Uh, and I think that churches are going to have to uh, uh, be innovative and, and flex to say, okay, how can the church continue to be the church? If you uh, left all this responsibility of the church being the church up to the pastor and the paid staff, like it's their job to do ministry, not mine, then it's probably not much of a change for you to sit back and wait for them to do their ministry again when everybody but, but that's but that's not what actually ministry is. That's not what the Christian life is. So I think there's going to be some helpful and healthy ways that we correct ourselves, you know, through all this. Okay. But I also think that um, I, I, I've been worried about this, actually, for a couple of weeks. I've talked about it a couple of times on Breakpoint uh, that, you know, I'm probably less concerned about the government calling the church non-essential as I am as other Christians thinking already that the church is non-essential. And I, I guess I've been a little bit convicted about my um, despair on that topic because the church has proved itself remarkably, remarkably innovative. And it's also not our project, right? If you ever study church history, it'll give you great hope. Not that it was went well, <laughs> but that it was so bad that it had to be God governing this thing. It had to be the Holy Spirit leading this thing because it, it did not have a prayer of survival otherwise. And I think that that's, um, I, so I've been a little, uh, I guess, chastened in my disbelief that, um, you know, God's got this and there's going to be some wonderful innovations, but it'll have to go back to, this is the church being the church. And there may have been some ways prior to this, that the church wasn't being the church. That's a fantastic answer. And I wish we could do this all day long. Um, Thank you so much for being here. I know we have a hundred other questions coming in, but I know to keep us kind of rolling forward. Thank you so much. This has been a lot to chew on. Our hope is that people are going to take this and really kind of digest all of these different sessions so that we can talk more fruitfully with our friends and family and our neighbors about these things so that our conversations can be edifying, that we can be pointing people to the good and true uh, in what, what do we make out of this moment. So thank you so much for joining us, John. We're truly grateful. Well, listen, the role you guys play is essential because as we can talk about these theological things in the abstract, you guys give people on the ground, in your neighborhood, in your state, ways to apply it. And that's so important. So love you guys. It's great to be with you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Well, well I'm going to, at this, at this point, I'm going to circle over back to the main stage here and gear us up for the next and last really exciting talk. And then we'll do a little digestion. Uh, you know that our next speakers, probably first, maybe from HGTV with the show Flip It Forward, before it was taken away from them because they have dare say it, traditional Orthodox views on marriage and the family, the Benham brothers. Uh, we have uh, been thrilled to bring them to you in other venues. Uh, just powerful uh, examples of people standing on their faith. And they found themselves having to stand again against the waves of culture in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, David and Jason have a story to tell you, so we're going to turn it over to them at this point. Hey, we're the Benna Brothers, coming to you from Charlotte, North Carolina. We wish we could be in person with you. Uh, I'm David. This is my little brother, Jason. <laughs> He's been in my shadow for almost 45 years now. Yeah, and I'll but... tell you, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about redeeming the crisis. We're looking at what's happening in this nation right now with COVID. Um, and with the gross government overreach in the midst of a global pandemic, I mean, it's really the viewpoint discrimination, the selective enforcement, uh, yeah, we're experiencing it right here. And I'm gonna tell you a little story about that, but this isn't our first rodeo. Jason will be, tell you a story about that uh, for us as well. But I'll tell you, now is a time when we as believers need to be like the men of Issachar who understand the times and know what we should do. And, and when we're looking at this whole COVID crisis, and then we look to scripture. That's the first thing we want to do. We want to look to the scripture. Then we want to look inside and say, well, where's my heart? And then we want to look out. How can I step in? How can I help? And what Jason and I see is two very specific things. We see our rights and our responsibilities, our rights as American citizens and our responsibility as Christians. And that's what's really important is our responsibility as Christians is to be the voice of truth, is to step in and be uh, help to the helpless 
uh, especially for the widow and the orphan and the poor. We want to step in with these things. At the same time, we're American citizens. We have rights, and those rights are not given by government. They're given by God. They're supposed to be protected by government. So we're, we're fighting, you know, two sides of this battle in the midst of this crisis. And so uh, Jason and I, when uh, we look to Scripture and we see in the midst of the COVID crisis that, you know, uh, everybody's saying, okay, stay home, stay home. And in one regard, it's like, whoa, hold on a second. You're going to destroy our economy. On the other hand, I look at the last chapter, the last verse of the, the last book of the Bible in the Old Testament. And the Lord tells us, I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I smite the land with a curse. I'll tell you, the land is cursed when family is broken, period. We've gotten in all kinds of trouble for talking about family, for talking about marriage between a man and a woman. And the context of intimacy is only found within, the, within that. That's God's boundary. We get in all kinds of trouble now when you say that a man is a man and a, and a girl is a girl, a woman is a woman. We get in all kinds of trouble. But I'll tell you what, that's family. And God wants us to speak about family. Well, speaking about that, one of the responsibilities that we have as business leaders here in Charlotte and as Christians is that we have three abortion facilities here in our city. And when all the COVID laws came down, abortion remained open. Abortion remained an essential service. And so as a result of the essential service of abortion, uh, our 501c3 nonprofit public charity, Cities for Life, we actually provide real social services to these mothers. And since 2010, over 5,000 mothers have chosen life. And it's not just that they choose life. We plug them into a mentor network. We then help them with housing and assistance. Uh, we help them if they're in abusive relationships. We help them with rent. We help them with vehicles, getting new jobs, all of these things. We want to help them because we believe, according to Scripture, that family is central, that family is crucial. And we're there to actually help these mothers. Well, in the midst of all of this, when our governor handed down the, the uh, statewide statute, and we saw that abortion was essential and that those clinics would remain open. Well, Cities for Life, our public charity, we said, we are still going to go there and we're going to provide sidewalk counseling services. However, we're going to go above board. And what we're going to do is we're going to go to a skeleton crew of sidewalk counselors. We're going to stay six feet apart. We're going to have hand sanitizer. We actually took chalk, sidewalk chalk, and marked on the sidewalk spacing so that our folks could stay separate and stay spaced out. We didn't have to do that because we – are according to, we're, we're still considered an essential service according to the statewide statute. But we went above board because we do want to, you know, practice social distancing and these other things. Well, when uh, I got a phone call Saturday morning several weeks ago and they said, um, David, um, there are about 15 officers down here and they're threatening arrests with our sidewalk counselors. And I was like, what? What are you talking about? First of all, we've only got three sidewalk counselors there. So there's not more than 10 people, which was the, the, the law. And, uh, and second of all, we're a public charity. They, we're an essential service. So I rolled up to the abortion facility and sure enough, I saw our three sidewalk counselors. And then another uh, local pregnancy center had a mobile sonogram unit there, uh, a um, uh, by the sidewalk and they had two RV technicians or excuse me, two sonogram technicians on the RV. And I was like, okay, well, there's not 10 people here. And the officer came right up to me as soon as I got out of my truck. We need to ask you to leave. You're gathering a group of more than 10 people. And I was like, no, I'm not. That's crazy. Anyway, most of you've seen the video and then he just pushed and then they had another officer that was on the phone the whole time with the city attorney talking to the talking to the attorney and then looking to the officer that was speaking with me and whispering in the officer's ear. And then the officer would say, I'm sorry, you're just going to have to leave. And I was like, no, I'm not going to leave anyway. And then I just kept telling him, look, first of all, there's not 10 people here. And he kept saying, there's more than 10 people. I said, well, then go to the local park. There's probably 500 or 800 people there. And by the way, Home Depot's down the end of the corner. Go to Home Depot and make arrest. Or heck, go into the abortion facility and make an arrest. There's way more than 10 people inside of there and nobody's wearing masks and they're not, they don't have hand sanitizer. Nobody's socially distanced, but we, our sidewalk counselors were socially distanced. Anyway, um, I knew that that was a line in the sand and I'd never been arrested before a day in my life. And, uh, and I knew I, I can't well, right now we have rights. First, it's our responsibility to be a voice for the voiceless. We're going to do this as the church. And we were doing that. 
But now all of a sudden, our rights are being threatened. And I was like, uh-uh, I'm not going to budge. And they ended up arresting me. My heart broke. I mean, I, I, I had to choke back the tears. I felt like my brother for a minute. I had to choke <laughs> back the tears. I had to choke back the tears because I was so like, wow, this is my country. What is happening? The, you've got a liberal city attorney with a liberal mayor and a liberal governor in North Carolina that don't care about that, that they don't seem to care about the rights of pro-life Christians, not just pro-life Christians. Oh, it's becoming even worse. And it just really bothers me. And so as I'm getting arrested, as they, they, they were cuffing me, they walked me into uh, the car and put me in the back seat. And uh, one of the officers, he looked and he smiled at me and goes, I know why you're here. And he just smiled basically with an affirming nod. And he goes, can I make you more comfortable? And I'm like, yeah, get this, this thing off my uh, – loosen the cuff on my left hand because my hand had uh, lost uh, feeling. It was getting all numb. And so anyway, they, uh, he loosened it up for me. And then, But I do want to say this before I let Jason say anything because he doesn't just yeah, man. Sit, he doesn't just sit here and look good. You, but, you, and, and that's exactly right. I don't just yeah. sit here and look good. I'm wondering so, when I'm going to be able to jump in. Just you know? hold on. Everybody that's watching this right now is like, when's the dude in the blue going to be able you to You mean talk? when's the dude in a pajama shirt? This isn't a pajama up? shirt, it man. This like, is awesome. looks like a pajama look, shirt. See? Got a little V-neck right pajamas. Here. Oh, so, so here I am. I'm, I'm cuffed. And uh, I only found this out later uh, that while I was being arrested, there were two mothers – that were being side they are sidewalk counselors. I had two separate sidewalk counselors speaking to two mothers on that very at that very moment, and they actually went on board the mobile sonogram unit. They saw sonograms of their children. Both chose life. One of the mothers actually chose to give her heart to the Lord, and then we plugged them right into our mentor network. And one of our sidewalk counselors actually is also part of the mentor network. So now those mothers actually are being walked alongside. We're walking with them in this journey. It's one thing to be against abortion. It's another thing to be pro-life. So we actually are there really loving these families. Because I can tell you this, as soon as they get an abortion, they walk out the door, they're done. You, Planned Parenthood's not following up with them unless they want more abortions or they want more money. The abortion facility here in Charlotte, they're not following up with them unless they just want to protect themselves to make sure they didn't screw up. But I'll tell you this, Cities for Life and Pro-Life Ministries all around this nation, we're following up with these mothers because we love family, and we believe that family is the center. And speaking of family, this isn't our first rodeo into this type of thing because we were raised by the guy who baptized Norma McCorvey, who was the Jane Roe and Roe versus Wade Supreme Court case. He was a pastor in Dallas, Texas. Dallas just so happens to be the home of God's favorite football team. And if you disagree with that, it's a good thing that we're not in the same room together. Oh, come on. But uh, our dad was a pastor, and raising us uh, there as the pastor, and then he got really active in pro-life, and he taught us that if your theology does not become your biography, then your theology is worthless. And to prove it to us, he took his office out of our home. Uh, he had his church office there, and he moved it next to, next to the busiest abortion clinic in Dallas. One of the workers there was Norma McCorvey, who was the Jane Roe, the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court case. And within a matter of a couple years from the witness of my dad and getting a chance to spend time with him, he uh, had an opportunity to baptize Norma, and she got radically saved. And, of course, there's this new documentary out on, on uh, AKA, F Jane, whatever it is. But anyway, trying to twist the narrative that she was paid and all that kind of stuff, none of that is true. But the fact is, is that God uh, allowed our family to be so incredibly active in the pro-life ministry, and that's what set us up. So when I saw David get arrested, and of course, people were wondering, you know, where were you during that time, Jason? Afraid. I, I was running the business. <laughs> I was making sure that David had money to, to feed his kids while he was in the clink. Mm -hmm. But he was in, the, in jail, and about 30 minutes later, my dad comes walking in he got thrown in jail too yeah I know. and then about 30 minutes after that his son bailey got walked uh, got they nailed in. all three of us and father son yeah. and then grandson so my dad was sitting there and he's like this is like the greatest day of my life anyway that's where that by god's grace we had a dad who showed us what faithfulness looks like in the midst of a crisis how do you redeem a crisis you continue to be faithful in the midst of it that's how you do it, no and matter the cost. We, we, our dad was so incredibly faithful because we're talking family here because God really can do something in the midst of this crisis 
for family. We look at Proverbs 22, 6. says, train up a child in the way he should go, and in the end he won't depart from it. The Hebrew phrase for train up means to touch the palate of. And what the Hebrew moms used to do is they take their babies and they would open their mouths and they would take, uh, the moms would take little pieces of vegetables and, and chew it up really fine and put a piece of it on the tip of their finger. They'd open the mouth of their baby and touch the palate of their baby with that food. And when they would do that, it would kick in the salivary glands for that baby and the baby would begin to uh, crave the food that was placed on their palate. That's the phrase there, to train up your child, which is touch the palate of, which is create an appetite in your kids for the things of the Lord. So when we were kids, we woke up every morning, we caught our dad either, and our mom, both of them, our dad and our mom, either reading their Bibles or praying in front of the couch. It was one of those two things. And in time, we began to catch those things. And so that's how... The, the appetite was created in us for that. Fast forward to 2013, 2012, 2013, my brother and I, we had these businesses. They were at the height, uh, and God had blessed our companies. We had 100 offices in 35 states, specifically in the real estate sector, and we had just gotten done playing professional baseball, and so God had really blessed us. HGTV came around, and they wanted to do a reality television show with my brother and I, and, uh, and they offered us this big deal. And we're like, wow, we were coming up at the same time the Gaines family was coming up. And HG said, we're going to bring both of you up because we know that, that families rate now. Yeah. They said that Nielsen rating, they, they love family content. And so we were, where is that reported? We were pumped. I mean, in professional baseball, we never made it to the big leagues. You know, I voluntarily left the game. David couldn't hit a curveball to save his life. So he had to get ushered out of the game. But we never made it to the big leagues, and now this HGTV thing was here, and we had an opportunity for kind of like a new big leagues. But yet at the same time, we were very active in, uh, in standing for our faith. We were, we were very active in the pro-life ministry. We had started a ministry called Cities for Life, like David had mentioned earlier. And we also spoke out uh, to defend God's definition of marriage being defined between a man and a woman. And this was when uh, Phil Robertson with Duck Dynasty, it was, we had just signed with HGTV, so nobody even knew about us at this point. And uh, Phil Robertson got suspended for his comments about human sexuality in the context of marriage. Well, Jason and I are, you know, all of a sudden now getting phone calls from the executives at HG going, are you guys watching what's going on? Is this how you guys believe as well? And we're like, of course, it's exactly how we believe. Yes, and so we... we went out there and, and we continued to speak as we speak. And uh, five weeks into our film shoot, David and I found ourselves in the midst of a cultural firestorm with activist groups doing everything they could to threaten HGTV to get us off of their, off of their network. Otherwise, they were going to attack the uh, uh, advertisers and HGTV. They fought for us. They thought the world was falling in and they, uh, they ultimately caved, and we don't blame them for that, uh, but yet they caved to the pressure, and David and I were fired. And so many of you who have followed our story, if you have, know that from that point on, and David and I, if you read our book, Whatever the Cost, you'll see we had some pretty cowardly moments during that time where we really did want to kind of be quiet about our faith. I mean, we have to admit that because we had something to lose. We actually had a platform now and yeah. had some influence and a heck of a lot of income to lose. So we, we had all this to lose and we didn't want to lose it. So we're like, okay, well, we'll quiet down a little bit. And, and, and yet we made it through that without communicating that ever to HGTV. We had a great pastor of ours who rebuked us for that type of mentality. And then for, when we got fired, we knew at that point that God was thrusting us in the middle of a cultural firestorm because he wanted us to stand strong. But we knew that boldness apart from brokenness would make you a bully. We didn't want to stand bold, but not be broken over our sin. And after we had gone through some trials of our faith, we recognized that we're just cowards. And, and our one role was to stand boldly for the Lord and to let the Holy Spirit unleash our inner lion. And so we knew that boldness apart from brokenness would make you a bully. But on the other side, brokenness apart from boldness would make you a bystander. Brokenness over our sin. Brokenness, the, the proper, yeah. the right kind of brokenness. Not brokenness, you're out of the game. Brokenness, you're in the game. Our dad would always say, only those horses willing to be broken by their master are fit to pull the king's chariot. 
the rest are left to pasture. So we mean brokenness over our sin so that we can be tender and compassionate and empathetic when we deal with folks. But when you're broken for your sin and you're walking in humility and you actually love people, it's at that moment you can then use that as a foundation to stand boldly for the Lord. Yeah. When that happens, you become a bridge that connects heaven to earth. And that's what God gave us an opportunity to do. He had to break us first. Man, did he ever break us. What a crazy way that he broke us. But then we had to stand bold. And we really want to encourage Christians today, especially during this crisis. You want to redeem this crisis? Keep being faithful right where you are. Dig in and pour into your family, just like my dad and mom did for me and for David here. And then then when you have an opportunity to stand boldly, do it. Yeah. And let the chips fall where they may. And thank God for organizations like this that are fighting to defend our rights. Because, I mean, honestly, what we're seeing right now is just gross government overreach. And it's clear viewpoint discrimination. We see it on Facebook. We see it on Twitter. We see it on YouTube and Instagram. And, I mean, all of these things. We don't even know where it's going to end up. But one thing that we do know is redeeming the crisis in the midst of it all. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 11, he said, Blessed are you when men persecute you and falsely accuse you for my name's sake blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad. You know, this is a time of rejoicing. We look at, oh, is this the end times? Is we, we don't know, but we need to act like it is. We need to be faithful so that if we go down physically, we go down standing up in the name of Jesus Christ, because now is our moment. Now is our moment for believers to be like the men and women of Issachar who understand our times and know exactly what we should do. Now is not a time to be silent about our faith. Now is not a time to be quiet about the values of family and how the, the, the breakdown of the family is the ultimate result and the social thing seeing in this family. We've turned our back. Into the fog. Exactly. So, honor others. It feels very real, though. Or what? Like dirty. So, <laughs> you have to give it that element of what real. Little, uh, that was our little image of, um, hey, we're in the spring. <laughs> it's rainy outside, so let's make it real. Really Welcome nice to behind. COVID life. That's right. <laughs> hey, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for having us. Wow. Uh, you know, these are guys who have stood for their faith. And obviously, they got it from their father. They mentioned that he brought Norma McCurvey, of all people, uh, to the Lord. So they've been in a household, a family, which has really been our theme for today, of people standing on their faith. And he, and he told the story of, of being arrested now for his faith, not just having a TV show taken away, but now being arrested. But he's not the only one. We have seen this in Virginia. I'm here with Josh to tell us a little bit about what we've seen even right here in our home state, in our Commonwealth. Yeah. Um... Somewhat similar story, actually. Uh, a woman, uh, a great friend now, Sherry Britt, she uh, is the director of a ministry called Hope for Life. And we found out that she had gotten a criminal citation from the police um, maybe about a month, a month and a half ago, um, as a result of what they said, violating the governor's executive order 55. So. I, I was very, very curious about the facts of this situation. So I had actually talked to Sherry before on various pro-life uh, matters and because of her multi, uh, mobile ultrasound unit that she has in the, in the Virginia Beach area. And I called her and she told me the story and I was amazed at the facts. And uh, essentially, she was standing outside a Planned Parenthood, much like the, the Benham brothers were, and just... Uh, counseling women. She was offering free ultrasounds. She actually gave an, uh, free ultrasounds that day. And a woman who received one of those ultrasounds actually found out that she was having twins. And as a result, she chose life. And, but just for standing there, uh, observing the six feet rule and um, d doing everything according to what the order had asked, they, they gave her a criminal citation for it. And it was because Planned Parenthood uh, actually called the police on her. And one of the things that's really interesting about this situation is that our governor, Northam, uh, went out of his way to, to exempt abortion facilities as essential services, essentially. 
And despite the fact that under current law, you, you're required to have an ultrasound procedure prior to an abortion, which is what she was offering, uh, they said, no, you're violating the law. And, um, and, and I, I'll add to it, I, there, we have just recently gotten some good news this week about that case, actually. When we called her up um, you know, and heard about this, we had already been kind of deciding to, to build a legal arm at the Family Foundation. We saw the need for this, and we wanted to roll it out, hopefully July 1st, and obviously that was before the, the time, but we said, you know what, this is so important, we want to, to get in now. So we took on Sherry as our first client, and just this week, we're able to, uh, we, we wrote a letter to the city attorney, laid out everything for them, and, and they, uh, to their credit, dropped those charges. So uh, that's very, very good news, and we've got our first victory. So the Founding Freedoms Law Center, that's our new legal arm that's going to be officially uh, announced on July 1, is one and one for one, I guess you would say. It's that's a very right. exciting news. Now, we were thinking about it already, even before this happened, and one of the reasons was because there have been some laws put into place that really harm our religious freedom. Can you just give us a little excerpt about what we're expecting on July 1 and why we felt yeah. like we had to take another step? Well, July 1 each year is when all of the new laws that the General Assembly passed in January and February and March go into effect. And this year, they did a whole lot of things that they've been wanting to do for a long time, in many cases further and more radical than in any other state, and particularly uh, ones that add sexual orientation and gender identity, uh, which, which as, as we all know now, cause conflicts with especially people of faith. And... Um, so one of the things that's, that we anticipate is going to happen, and they, they were very clear that they intended this to happen, was uh, basically to prevent churches and religious schools from being able to hire and fire who they want according to their faith tenets. Um, and a public accommodations issue with whether it be bathrooms or, or who may be allowed to become a member of your church based on these issues. So th there's a critical, critical liberty issues here, especially for uh, churches and religious schools. Of course, it applies to businesses as well, so the cake bakers and the florists. And so, you know, there are a lot of these things that, that we're really looking to get in on and help people because we know the victims are coming. That's, I think, the hardest part of this is seeing the laws, trying to tell the legislature that you are harming people's religious faith and their ability to live out their faith and them essentially saying, sorry, too bad, that's what we intend. And so for the Family Foundation, that was kind of the last straw. Um, we work amazingly well with groups like Alliance Defending Freedom. We partner in many, many lawsuits um, that they take on as the lead. But we do feel like there has to be on the ground help here in Virginia also. There's just going to be too much. Uh, we fully expect that churches, Christian schools, and others are going to run into this clash where they simply say, no, we're trying to, for example, in a school, hire teachers that model the beliefs that we're teaching our children. So all that to say, we're excited about our legal center and gearing up. Um, it's one of many things, but particularly because at the Family Foundation, we've had an arm of pastors and churches that we have worked with for a long time, Virginia's pa Virginia Pastors Network. That is our pastoral arm where we say, we want to help bridge for you in ministry how you better understand what's happening happening in the public policy space? How do we arm and equip our pastors to better take on the issues of the culture and the laws that are coming at them? And so uh, it felt like when you have a pastor's arm like this and you spend all this time saying, please stand strong on the issues, please tell your people uh, to live out their faith, and here we'll equip you as best as we can, we couldn't really kind of not say, hey, we're going to come and have your back legally as well. And so we're thrilled uh, to basically be taking this on. It's one of many new initiatives, as you can see at the Family Foundation, between Speak Up Virginia with our new grassroots and this legal arm and so much more going on. Uh, we'd love to stay here all day and tell you about it, but we're not going to. Um, at this time, all I'm going to do is kind of close out by saying that we are so thankful to our sponsors who are helping us uh, get to our goal with this simulcast that is, in fact, a benefit simulcast. Uh, 
Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, we have a $100,000 goal. We had sponsors get us all the way to $85,000. If you feel like you have been touched by our, our mission, that you want to be a part of what we're doing, and you haven't been impacted economically in a way that prevents you from doing so, please consider uh, making a gift now. We're going to put back up on the screen for you the text number. Um, we're also going to, at the very end of this, you're going to see a roll of slides that will have not just the text number that you send the word redeem to, but also uh, we'll have the, the slide on our equip program for students. You might have a young person in your life, the speak up, how do you text in to sign up for speak up. Um, so when we wrap this, take that extra second to just watch the slide roll through so that you get all the information of these upcoming programs. Uh, let me just say we have been honored and thrilled that you have spent your afternoon with us. I think you've, uh, like me, received so much amazing content from our speakers. We're just essentially thrilled that our goal, the Family Foundation, this is what we've always said, is as believers, we feel that we have been given the keys to abundant life, not just in the hereafter, but in the now. And that, that through scripture, we know that family was created to be the solution, that it's not, you know, everybody's out looking for a vaccine, but we know strong families and cherishing human life and understanding the principles that God has given us are how our society is going to not just, uh, endure, but, but how families are really going to thrive. And so uh, we're thankful that these speakers kind of point us back to those truths. And our goal for you today is simply to be able to walk out of the simulcast with some nuggets, some things that you can share with friends and neighbors. Everybody's having conversations about these pandemics. Let's make them, let's redeem these conversations. Let's take them to the next level and point people all around us to why our society needs to value human life, both the unborn and what we see happening in the tragic situation situation that has led us to these riots this past weekend. We've got to value every human life from the very beginning to our elderly in all phases, in all, uh, in all aspects of life. And so we just hope you grab some nuggets today and that you're able to take those uh, to people around you. With that, I'm simply going to say thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day.